I have given very careful consideration to the member's request to lodge a manuscript amendment. As members may be aware, at this stage, a manuscript amendment may be moved only with my agreement. In deciding whether to allow an amendment, I must take into account the disadvantages to other members of the lack of notice. The guidance on public bills says that agreement should not normally be given to move a manuscript amendment, which could equally well have been lodged before the deadline. While I accept that this amendment could not have been lodged before the deadline, a manuscript amendment could equally have been lodged at any time ahead of today's proceedings after the judgment was given last Tuesday. Seeking to lodge today gives no notice to members, and on that basis, I do not intend to let it be taken. I note that we now come to a group of amendments dealing with the Equality Act, and so not allowing this amendment to be moved does not prevent members debating the issues that Ms Hamilton raises. We move to Group 13, which is... Point of order, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, it is now uh, ten past four. Is that one? The Scottish Parliament. Uh, Officer, I'm not quite sure what, what. I think I've got the time right. I wasn't sure that was wrong. It's now ten past four and twenty six seconds. But the Scottish Parliament's business bulletin, as revived by the motion at midnight this morning, State that portfolio questions were due to commence at 3.15 p.m. This was a defined time and not the usual follow-on business, as in the case for most bulletins. We are now past 3.15, and MSPs have not been offered a chance to ask questions to Cabinet Secretary and Ministers. We have not even been told, even if we will get the chance to do so. Can I remind the Chamber that the Agenda Recognition Bill is not an emergency legislation? and it should not supersede all other business. Ministers having been, ministers being held to account by elected representatives is the bread and butter of this parliament, and we cannot let sideline be the sideline once again so that this bill can be rushed through before Christmas. I personally have a rule affairs question today, which I am looking forward to asking, and I would seek your clarity with regards to the business bulletin. When will portfolio questions take place? If, President Officer, you do not know, will you perhaps ask business managers to meet urgently to discuss the matter, as it is important for members around the Chamber and their constituents that these questions are asked today? Thank Mr Balfour for his point of order. The Business Bulletin does indeed reflect the um, agreement of the Cross-Party Parliamentary Bureau. We will proceed with this business at the moment, but business managers will liaise in due course and we will come back to members. We move to Group 13, which is Interaction with the Equality Act 2010, the concept of sex and single-sex services. I call Amendment 54 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 54 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And let me just uh, begin by addressing uh, some of the points raised by uh, Rachel Hamilton because they are relevant to this group. Uh, let me first of all say the ruling for absolute clarity made absolutely clear that the Scottish Parliament cannot modify the Equality Act. As I have previously set out to Parliament, we welcome the outcome of the petition uh, of Forum in Scotland Limited for judicial review, which is that the Scottish Government's statutory guidance on the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Act 2018 has been held to be lawful and the petition dismissed. But, as this Chamber is aware, uh, these remain live proceedings with the possibility of an appeal. And I won't therefore comment in detail. But what I will say is our position has always been consistent with that of the Equality and Human Rights Commission on this matter. And as I set out at stage two of the bill, that for the purposes of the Equality Act 2010, sex does take into account the legal effect of a GRC obtained in accordance with the Gender Recognition Act 2004. Nothing has changed uh, in this uh, ruling. It is the status quo as was the case uh, before. Yes. Rachel uh, Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I was clearly disappointed that my manuscript amendment was not accepted, uh, but understand uh, the, the Presiding Officer's um, view. <clears throat> um, I want to ask the Cabinet Secretary 
if a gender recognition certificate, which now confers on you at least some of the protections afforded by the Equality Act, and given that I wasn't allowed to debate the implications of my potential manuscript amendment, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm what protections for women are granted to those with GRCs and which protections are not under the Equality Act? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I said at the beginning, the ruling has made absolutely clear that the Scottish Parliament cannot modify the Equality Acts, therefore there are no changes whatsoever to any of the protections under the Equality Act. They remain the same. Lady Haldane was absolutely clear about this. The Bill does not amend the legal effects of obtaining a gender recognition certificate, which are set out principally in Section 9 of the 2004 Act. Therefore, the Judicial Review ruling uh, does not impact uh, on the Bill. I want to go on to the rest of the amendments uh, in this group. Following discussions, I have answered your point. Yes, I will. Yes. Michelle Thompson. The Cabinet, uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for giving way. Now, uh, Roddy Dunlop KC makes the case that uh, this matter doesn't grant or lose people rights. And I don't disagree with his eminent view. However, it does clearly introduce considerable complexity on existing rights and the practical function and effect particularly on women, has consistently been ignored. And I'm sure that element of it will subsequently be legally tested. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with that? Cabinet Secretary. Well, what I would say to Michelle Thompson is that the case has maintained the status quo that has been the position since 2004, so 20 years, that the purpose and effect of a gender recognition certificate is to be able to change your birth certificate uh, to um, in, in line with the acquired gender. That is the purpose and effect of a GRC. This bill changes none of that. And uh, we couldn't change the Equality Act even if we wanted to. That is just not possible. I want to move on to the rest of the amendments because there are a lot uh, of amendments I want to comment on. Uh, following discussions with members, I have lodged Amendment 54 in my name, which places a duty on Scottish ministers to publish guidance on the operation of the Act. And this was an ask of members, which I am happy to provide for, and the amendment uh, says that we will do this in consultation with human rights organisations. And as I have also made clear to members, this amendment is within the legislative competence of this Parliament. Before I speak to the other amendments in this group, I do want to remind members that responsibility for the Equality Act is reserved to the UK Parliament, just as immigration and nationality, including asylum, is reserved, as we uh, debated in Group 3. So, to be clear, as I said earlier, any amendment agreed uh, to today, which may be out with competence, puts the aims of the Bill as a whole at risk. And while some people, just a minute, while some people may oppose this Bill, Every member in this chamber has not just a responsibility but a duty to make competent law and I know that every member takes their role as a legislator for our country seriously. I'll give way. Yes. Daniel Johnson. I am very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way and she is quite correct that obviously any bit of legislation that sought to alter the impact or effect of reserved legislation would not be competent. However, this Parliament does regularly legislate using uh, definitions defined in reserved law. So, such as the point in 2016 when we altered the franchise of this Parliament, we made an explicit reference to the Immigration Act of 1975, and indeed we have done so on a number of other occasions. We are not altering the definitions or the things that are specified in that law but we use the definitions and clarify how this Parliament and how we, our legislation seeks to use them. That doesn't put our laws in breach, it doesn't call into question, it doesn't fall foul of the Scotland Act. So if we do it in those legislative circumstances, why can't we do it in this one? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'll, I'll come on to that point in my remarks, uh, if, if you don't mind. The bill uh, already provides the reassurance that members thought, sought that this does not modify the Equality Act, and this was done through a stage two amendment that we agreed with Pam Duncan Glancy and which covers the Equality Act in its entirety. Not just now. To pick the Equality Act apart by stating further that the Bill does not modify some provisions of that Act when there is already patently provision in the Bill that it does not modify the whole of the Equality Act causes confusion within the law. 
Provisions that do that now, on top of Mr Duncan Glancy's amendment, I think are unnecessary and unhelpful. In addition, it's for, and this is really important, it's for the Equality and Human Rights Commission, as a reserve body, in terms of its statutory functions, to provide guidance on the effects of the Equality Act 2010, and it's for Scottish ministers or the Register General to provide guidance on the effects or operation of the Bill. Therefore, I cannot support any uh, amendments in this group apart from my own for those reasons. Yes. Stephen Kerr. Stephen Kerr. Uh, apologies, Presiding Officer. Um, so I'm just anxious to know, before we vote on any of the amendments that are in this section, I'm quite anxious to know, I think in very clear terms, will the Cabinet Secretary confirm that someone who is issued with a GRC would have access to single-sex spaces? Can we just have a very clear answer about the implications? Cabinet Secretary. Not if the organisation providing those services uh, used the exceptions under the 2010 Act. They could be excluded, as I have said so many times in this chamber. Nothing changes. So if an organisation had a service that they wanted to restrict to being single sex, then they could do that in the same way as they can do now. This bill changes none of that whatsoever, and I hope that gives members the reassurance that they uh, require. There are a few amendments uh, in this group on guidance. Amendment 111 in the name of Jackie Bailey would place a duty on Scottish ministers to issue guidance on the impact of this Act, and in particular on the provision of single-sex services and what would be considered a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim in that context. And that refers to particular sections of the Equality Act. Amendment 120 in the name of Rachel Hamilton and Amendment 73 and 74 in the name of Sue Webber are similar. Amendment 117 in the name of Polly McNeill would place a duty on Scottish ministers to provide guidance on the effect of having a GRC, in particular to set out how obtaining one impacts of, on the rights of the rights in the Equality Act. And her Amendment 129 places a duty on Scottish ministers to consult each Scottish public authority regarding the operation of the exceptions in Schedule 3 of the Equality Act. And Amendments 118 and 119 in the name of Claire Baker would place a duty on Scottish ministers to issue guidance on the impact of the Bill on Section 22 of the 2004 Gender Recognition Act and Schedule 9 of the Equality Act. The Scottish Government cannot provide legal advice to external bodies. Guidance on the test of a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim, as required in the Equality Act, is for the Equality and Human Rights Commission. The Scottish Government will always promote and encourage observance of the Equality Act, but is properly for the EHRC, not the Scottish Government, to provide guidance on the effects of the Equality Act. I'll take Claire Baker. Claire Baker. Can we have Clare Baker's microphone, please? B bear with us a moment, Ms Baker. Ms Baker, can I ask you just to remove your card and replace it? Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, in a briefing in advance of Stage 2, the EHRC said that in relation to the UK and the Scottish Government, that they must provide and ensure clarity for employers and service providers on the law. This would suggest that the EHRC do think there is a role for governments to provide clarity on this. Yeah, but what the Secretary. HRC also know that in terms of the operation of the Equality Act, it is for them to lead. What I have set out is in terms of the guidance of the operation of this bill, which of course has a role for us uh, as ministers. What we said about the Equality Act, however, to go further and to maybe address uh, some of Clare Baker's concerns, is that if they want to revise the guidance in the light of this bill, or this act, uh, should it pass, then we would work with them in doing that. But we've got to respect them as the lead organisation uh, for matters that impact on the Equality Act. Now, the EHRC provides guidance already for individuals, organisations and the public sector, as well as a, a statutory code of practice, which assists service providers with understanding the relevant issues 
And this includes already uh, published guidance for service providers looking to establish and operate a separate or single sex service. Yes. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for taking an intervention and I understand the, the statutory um, responsibilities that the EHRC have over, over the Equality Act. But I wonder if she'd accept that, um, for example, in a letter recently from um, Minister Kevin Stewart to health boards, there was recognition that protocols would need to be in place to support people, um, trans people and others, in order to be able to provide, to provide services. On that basis, surely the Cabinet Secretary can accept that it is acceptable for the Scottish Government to direct devolved bodies on how to provide services and organisations how to deliver services to, on the basis of any piece of legislation. Well, Cabinet as I've Secretary. just said, the operation, the guidance on the operation of this bill is absolutely uh, <clears throat> for us to set out. And we've I've already acknowledged and accepted that we will do that. But that's different from the operation of the Equality Act, which has the lead of the EHRC in statute. They're the statutory body. So we can't lead on that. They have to lead on that. What I have said, though, is that we'll work with them on doing that. But they have to be the lead body. I, I can't be any clearer uh, than that. And I agree that it is important for clear guidance to help people and, organi and organisations understand their own rights and responsibilities as set out in the Equality Act, which is why, as I've just said, I've said to the HRC that I'd be happy to work with them should their guidance require to be updated following the Bill. And uh, we will highlight where additional guidance would be helpful, and I'll repeat that commitment now. Amendment 112 in the name of Ash Regan specifies that nothing in the Act affects any provision to which uh, Section 9.3 of the Gender Recognition uh, 2004 uh, applies. As we have uh, set out on a number of occasions, the Bill does not amend the effect of a GRC as provided for principally in Section 9 of the 2004 Act, and therefore I cannot support an amendment which says the Bill does not amend a section it obviously does not amend. I also do not support her Amendment 113 which specifies that nothing in this Act affects specific sections of the Equality Act, uh, nor do I support the similar Amendment 130 in the name of uh, Jackie Bailey, which specifies that nothing in this Act prevents the provision of a service only to persons of one sex under Schedule 3 of the 2010 Act, modifies the protected characteristic of gender assignment, or modifies the definitions of sex, man, woman in the 2010 Act. Amendment 133 in the name of Jamie Green places a duty on Scottish Ministers to publish a report no later than three years after the Act has come into force on a review of the impact of this Act on the Equality Act. This is important. As I have already said, the Bill as amended already states, for the avoidance of doubt, that the bill, this Bill does not modify the Equality Act in its entirety in any way. And to pick the Equality Act apart in this way causes confusion within the law, particularly when there is already provision added to the Bill at Stage 2 that, for the avoidance of doubt, it does not modify the 2010 Act. Yes. Liam Kerr. I am genuinely grateful and I am genuinely struggling, Cabinet Secretary, so I wonder if you can make this very clear for me. What I am struggling to understand, if obtaining uh, a GRC under the Haldane judgment means that a man with a GRC uh, is a woman, then, doesn't, then, then what is the legal basis, going back to Stephen Kerr's intervention, for excluding that category of person from a single sex space? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, trans women can be excluded from a single sex space. That is in the Equality Act as an exception. And nothing has changed with this bill whatsoever. Um, as I said, the, the judgment is entirely in line with the position of the Equality and Human Rights Commission, literally the body that oversees the Equality Act. Our position is exactly the same as theirs. Well, very briefly. Ash Regan. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. I do think this is a very important point that we need to dis 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 um, be allowed to debate. So the government's position, uh, as I understand it, which I happen to not agree with, but the government's position is that exemptions are still operable. So I'd like to know what assessment um, the government has done on the chilling effect on what could often be quite small um, single-sex service providers. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I don't believe that uh, that will be the case in terms of a chilling effect. But in recognition of the cons any concerns, what I have said 
is that in terms of the guidance of the operation of this bill, that we will set out that guidance, but it is for the Equality and Human Rights Commission to set out the guidance to public bodies to make sure that when they are applying those exceptions, and it has to be on a proportionate basis, that they are doing so and keeping themselves on the right side of the law. Uh, that is very clear. The guidance, I think, is very clear. But if it has to be reviewed, if the HRC thinks it has to be reviewed, that is a matter for them, and we will uh, assist them uh, with that. I'm going to make some progress, if you don't mind. Um, I don't support members, amendment... Members, sorry, Cabinet Secretary. I think it's fair to say that members have been very good so far in listening to one another, and I'd like us to continue with that. Cabinet Secretary. Thanks. Uh, I don't support Amendment uh, 121 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, uh, which would place a, a duty on Scottish ministers to report on the impact of the bill on the provision of single-sex services every year. I don't think that is disproportionate uh, reporting uh, requirement. I don't support Amendment 61 in the name of Pam Gosal, which would place a duty on ministers to report on the impact of the bill on self-exclusion uh, from services. Exceptions in the Equality Act enable single-sex services to exclude trans people or treat them less favourably where it is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. Those exceptions apply whether the person has a GRC or not, and this bill does not change that. There is no impact uh, to measure uh, from the bill, and any self-exclusion that does occur is more likely uh, to be caused uh, by uh, uh, misinformation and, and concerns. Amendment 123, in the name of Pam Gosal, uh, would place a duty on Scottish ministers to report on the impact of this Act on fun the funding of single-sex services. It's not clear to me what the funding of such, such services has to do with the bill about applying for legal gender recognition. And I see no possible impact and therefore can't uh, support such an amendment. Amendment 128 in the name of Polly McNeill, and I'll let Pauline in and Polly McNeill in, in a minute, in the name of Polly McNeill is an, uh, an avoidance of doubt provision that nothing in this Act affects any requirement to collect data on sex as defined in section 11 of the 2010 Act. I don't believe this amendment adds uh, value for the reasons that I have explained on the other amendments and therefore I won't be supporting it, but I'm happy to take an intervention from Polly McNeill. Thank you, Cabinet Pauline Secretary. McNeil. It was following on from Ash Derham's intervention where you answered that the exemptions can be used and that is of course correct. But I wondered if the Cabinet Secretary might want to offer an opinion then as to why rape crisis centres, for example, who have tried to use the exclusions, have experienced a great deal of resistance to this. Uh, many organisations who have tried to use the exemptions, which are lawful, uh, don't seem to be able to use them. And I wondered if that gives the Cabinet Secretary cause for concern, because if all of this boils down to, well, in any case, you can exclude anyone, but incidentally, you can't ask someone's trans status to make it a bit difficult. But anyway, on that point, surely she must know loads of organisations are really at the end of their tether because they're trying to use the exemptions and they're not able to. Cabinet Secretary. Well, some some organisations have used the exemptions and others have chosen to be trans inclusive. That is ultimately for that organisation to decide their policy as long as their policy is within the law and follows the guidance and is proportionate. Um, we can't dictate to each organisation what their policy is. They have to follow the guidance and they have to keep themselves on the right side of, of the law. I want to turn finally and importantly to Amendment uh, 127 in the name of Jackie Bailey, uh, which provides that paragraph 28 of Schedule 3 of the 2010 Act on exceptions from gender reassignment discrimination uh, continues to apply to activity or conduct carried out in Scotland, even where an individual holds a Scottish uh, GRC. Now, members asked me uh, yesterday about the degree of, of risk of amendments, and I think, to be clear, this would be at the top of the risk to the bill list, for reasons that I'll come on to. Uh, it is trying to clarify the effect of reserved legislation, and we can't do that in a devolved bill. Let me uh, just say a little bit more, because this uh, is, is important. Whatever the intention of that amendment, uh, and I'm sure it's well intended, in legal form, the provision would legislate to continue the effect of reserved provisions of the Equality Act. 
And we believe the amendment is at serious risk of being out with legislative competence. The amendment specifies circumstances where paragraph 28 of Schedule 3 of the Equality Act on gender reassignment discrimination applies, stating that it continues to have effect where a person holds a GRC. That is consistent with our understanding of the effect of the Equality Act, but that Act makes no mention of GRCs. This amendment purport, purports to clarify paragraph 28, which is reserved law, and so there is a serious risk of the amendment being out with competence. This amendment is different in its effect from the provision already in the Bill, and this might be Daniel Johnson's point, uh, which states that the Bill does not modify the Equality Act. That provision uh, states plainly that this bill does not modify the Equality Act, whereas this amendment, 127, seeks to clarify what the Act does. Now, I hope members will remember that the disputed section of the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Act 2018 was found in the first judicial review on appeal to have impinged upon equal opportunities as a reserved matter. Uh, very briefly. Daniel Johnson. So again, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for being so explicitly why I was giving the example that I did, because it actually confers rights upon individuals based on the status defined in, in law. So in, in very much the same way, borrows on a, uh, on a definition in reserved law in terms of functions being legislated by this, which is similar to this. So I, I again, un, don't understand why this legislation falls far of that, but previous legislation does not. Well, there has been previous legislation which has been in the same uh, bracket and I understand that uh, ministers at the time of the Land Reform Bill, for example, had to write to members on the same basis. The difference, as I've just set out, uh, was the, the, the provision already in the Bill, which I know some members have said, so if we were able to put for the avoidance of doubt at stage two, what is the difference? Well, the difference is that the provision already in the Bill states that the Bill does not modify the Equality Act, but the, that provision uh, states plainly that this Bill does not modify the Equality Act, whereas, as I said earlier, this amendment seeks to clarify what that Act does. Now, I would like to re-emphasise a point that some members... Um, uh, mentioned yesterday, and that is if a provision of the Bill, as passed, is subject to legal challenge, it is absolutely not the case that the rest of the Bill can proceed meanwhile. The entire Bill would be referred and therefore delayed and put at risk, uh, and I have to be clear uh, with members uh, about that. So I, I hope uh, that those who support this Bill, a point I made yesterday as well, there will be some members in this chamber who don't support this bill and therefore it will not be of concern to them. But I know for members who do support this bill and don't want a delay, uh, we, should not be in, uh, we should not be putting barriers in the way and we should not be putting uh, this bill at serious legal risk. So I would urge members to uh, support my amendment 54, uh, not to support the other amendments in this group, uh, particularly 127 for all the reasons that I have set out. Thank you. I call Jackie Bailey to speak to Amendment 111 and other amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and can I apologise to the Chamber in advance for the length of my contribution, but there are substantial issues to consider. There are three amendments that I have lodged in relation to the protections that exist in the Equality Act. Amendment 130, Amendment 127 and Amendment 111. When Scottish Labour supported the Bill at Stage 1, we were clear that significant improvements were needed if it was to respond to concerns expressed in particular by many women's groups and individual women in order to have public confidence. At every stage we've sought to work with others to deliver these changes and we continue to do so this afternoon at stage three. Now at stage two Scottish Labour were successful in placing reference to the Equality Act on the face of the bill and that was supported by the Scottish Government but they didn't go far enough and rejected an amendment from Foisal Chowdhury and continue to reject amendments today. Um, we recognised that concerns remain, not least following the intervention of the UN Rapporteur on eliminating violence against women and girls, who said that amending the application process for a GRC makes upholding the protections for women and girls in the Equality Act very important. Hence the amendments before you today. Now, Labour is proud to have passed the Equality Act in 2010, 
as reserved legislation. We know that it cannot be changed by this Parliament, but we believe it is important that service providers and public bodies have clarity about their legal obligations under the 2010 Act and this legislation. For that reason, to provide clarity and reassurance, I have lodged a number of amendments, taking first Amendment 130. This amendment references the exceptions within the Equality Act that allow for the provision of single-sex spaces and services and makes clear that they continue to apply. It states plainly that nothing in this new legislation changes or modifies the exceptions that exist in the Equality Act under Schedule 3 or modifies the definitions in the Equality Act for both the protected characteristics of sex and of gender reassignment. It repeats exactly the language in the Equality Act, nothing more, nothing less. And the purpose is to emphasise the primacy of the Equality Act of 2010, ensuring single-sex spaces are protected where it is necessary to do so. Now, I know that there have been concerns that providers are not clear on the legal position with the use of these exceptions, or that these exceptions have been used appropriately. What this amendment therefore does is clarify that despite any changes brought about by this bill, service providers can continue to offer single-sex services in accordance with the legal test in paragraph 28 of Schedule 3, and by doing so, they are, those tests are met. They can also exclude trans people from these services in certain circumstances. Subsection 2 of the amendment 130 also states that this bill would do nothing to change the Equality Act definition of gender reassignment, which does not require a GRC. The effect of this subsection is to emphasise that it continues to be a defence to the charge of gender reassignment discrimination that a person was excluded from a single-sex service where it was done in accordance with the test set out in the Equality Act. Now, my understanding is that Lord Haldon made clear in her judgment that sex and gender reassignment are distinct and separate protected characteristics, even if not mutually exclusive. So should a trans woman be excluded from a single sex service on the basis of her gender reassignment, the exception in paragraph 28 would apply to allow for this to be permissible. And I see that the Cabinet Secretary is nodding. I'm happy to take an intervention. Stephen Kerr. Does Jackie Bailey agree with Lord McConnell? who at the weekend wrote, if, if I might um, quote from his words, there are really serious concerns about safe spaces for women, especially those facing and dealing with the trauma of abuse, violence and rape, has been highlighted in the debate. And picking up on the point that was made earlier, the chilling effect of what happens when there is an attempt to apply these exceptions for any organisation uh, is a very real thing. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the member for the intervention? That's exactly why we're bringing forward these amendments today, and I hope that he and his party will support them. Because Amendment 130 is intended to put beyond doubt that this continues to be the case in Scotland. And I, I am aware that the Scottish Government's rationale for opposing amendments that pull out specific sections of the Equality Act is that it somehow weakens the bill. And I, I genuinely don't get it. The Government I don't believe has convincingly set out how changing the procedure for applying for a GRC is weakened simply by noting that existing reserved legislation remains unchanged. Amendment 130 and my, wait, give me one second, Amendment 130 and my other amendments are carefully worded so that they do not interpret the Equality Act, they merely reference the relevant sections, literally word for word. I give way to the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. Um, as we pass the amendment at stage two, which of course was done uh, in, uh, jointly with Pam Duncan Glancy, it was to put beyond doubt, for the avoidance of doubt, that nothing in the Equality Act was changed by this bill. Does Jackie Bailey not acknowledge that by then picking out parts of the Equality Act beyond that catch-all just leads to not just confusion, but actually could lead to legal uh, misunderstandings, interpretation, which could be really unhelpful in terms of this, law, this bill? Jackie Bailey. Um, I think my Amendment 130 has exactly the opposite effect. It is about spelling out clearly an area of concern that has been raised with members across this Parliament, and that's why it's so important. 
Um, let me turn to, if, if I could make some progress, please. Hey. Let me turn to Amendment 127, which seems to have caused much controversy. Um, this amendment makes clear that the exception in the Equality Act, which allows for the exclusion of trans people from single-sex spaces, continues to apply as before, even if someone obtains a GRC under the new application process set out in the bill. The Cabinet Secretary actually stated exactly the same thing last week in the Chamber, almost word for word, when responding to an urgent question. So my intention in lodging this amendment is to give clarity and reassurance to service providers that they can continue to make use of this exception where appropriate to do so and whether necessary legal tests are met, as set out in the Equality Act. The Scottish Government, allow me to make some progress, the Scottish Government have suggested that this amendment may be trying to interpret the Equality Act, but again, it is carefully drafted so that it references exactly the exception in the Equality Act, does not add or take away from it. There was a... Ruth McGuire. Ruth McGuire. I thank Jackie Bailey for taking the intervention. You mentioned service providers and the importance of them knowing the law. Would you agree that it's also important that funders know what service providers are and aren't allowed to, uh, to provide? Jackie Bailey. I absolutely agree. It's not just service providers, it's funders. It is also the general public having an awareness of what this all means. So I welcome that intervention. Now, the Scottish Government are saying that by accepting this amendment, um, the bill is at risk. And I genuinely do not find that argument persuasive. I don't want to do anything that risks this bill. But we know that the government itself have experience of this through the UNCRC fiasco, when amendments that they were warned about but pushed through led to a Supreme Court referral. We know that the Cabinet Secretary met the other day um, with the UK Minister for Women and Equalities to discuss this bill. I'm not sure of the content of the conversation, but it would be helpful to the Chamber if she could confirm whether there was a discussion that centred at all, or even touched on, the amendments raised in her letter the other day. Because if this, passing this amendment was as serious as described, surely, but surely, it would have been discussed. I will indeed. Rachel Hamilton. Uh, I thank Jackie Daly for taking uh, the intervention. Um, surely at this point, I'm, I'm trying to work out whether Jackie Bailey is trying to argue that Labour's original amendment at stage two, which it was in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, which said, for the avoidance of doubt, nothing in the Act modifies the Equality Act 2010. Now, bear with me, because how can that solve the issues that relate to the interaction between the Gender Recognition Act and the Equality Act, and I hope that's my understanding of what your argument you're trying to make, because it simply says that things um, will stay the same, but they're not because of Lady Haldane's court ruling. Um, our additional amendments are absolutely recognising the court ruling, but actually leaning into what is already in the Equality Act. So if you wish to protect single-sex spaces, if you wish to exclude, those provisions are already there. Lady Haldon's judgment does not change that at all. And that's why Amendment 130 is just so important. Let me go back to trying to conclude this, presiding officer, because I've got a lot more to say. But, but, but I genuinely don't accept, with the greatest respect, that Amendment 127 would put this bill at risk. It's not adding or interpreting the Equality Act. It merely states that paragraph 28 of Schedule 3 of the Equality Act 2010 continues to apply to activity or conduct carried out in Scotland, even in the circumstances where an individual holds a gender recognition certificate obtained under the Gender Recognition Act of 2004 or a confirmatory gender rec recognition certificate obtained under Section 801 of that Act, so i.e. a Scottish GRC under these new application processes. The salient phrase in the amendment being continues to apply. To say it does more is disingenuous and the evidence for this is that the same argument is not being applied to amendments 130 and 111. Now I know the Scottish Government don't like amendments 130 and 111 but they haven't written to me saying that they would risk the bill. Now, presiding officer, you know I'm a reasonable person. Amendment 130 and 111 
don't appear to cause the government the same problems. They weren't mentioned in their letter, and therefore I would consider withdrawing Amendment 127 if they would be willing to accept 130 and 111. Would they, I mean, I would genuinely be willing to give way to the Cabinet Secretary just now if she wants to indicate her support for Amendment 130 and 111. Cabinet Secretary. I can't do that for all the reasons that I've set out already, that the Equality Act for the Avoidance of Doubt Amendment, that nothing changes, is clean, clear. To start unpicking any piece of legislation and to select parts of it into another bill is not clear and is not helpful. But what I can say is that you, she's right insofar as the list of risks to the bill 127 is up there for all of the reasons that I have, have stated and have made clear. And it's not the case that 127 just reflects the wording of the Equality Act. The Equality Act does not refer to a GRC. So Jackie Bailey is just not correct on that. And I hope she does decide not to move 127 for those reasons. Jackie Bailey. Um, I think that was quite a long intervention, but, but my assessment of what the Cabinet Secretary said is that she has a preference for 130, and I hope the Chamber um, will listen to her on that and support it. But finally, let me turn to Amendment 111. This amendment requires the Scottish Government to produce guidance on the application of the legislation for devolved service providers and public bodies. The wording of this amendment matches closely the amendments on guidance which the Government itself has lodged after my discussion with them. The difference is that my amendment makes clear that this guidance should include the provision of single-sex spaces and the circumstances in which you can exclude, again, lifted from the Equality Act. So if the Cabinet Secretary wants to give me an assurance on the record that her amendment would cover this, then I would absolutely reflect on that. But I didn't hear that in her opening statement. Throughout the passage of the Gender Recognition Reform Bill, we have repeatedly warned the Scottish Government of the dangers of allowing a policy vacuum to develop because it leads to uncertainty for service users and for service providers in Scotland. These warnings have largely been ignored and we can see many different organisations attempting to navigate a path through the interaction of these acts, trying to respect everyone's rights and protections. But the silence from the Government is not appropriate and many groups have spoken to us about the dangers of differing interpretation of the legislation. With Amendment 111, we're making it clear that it is the Scottish Government's responsibility to provide clarity by setting out clear guidelines for the operation of this legislation with regard to the 2004 Act and the Equality Act of 2010. We believe that service providers' responsibilities will be made clearer and easier to implement. Now, the Scottish Government have suggested, and they've done it again today, that it's not within their remit to produce this guidance. It is the job of others, and they will work with them. That's great. But I reject that assertion that they don't have any remit to do this. The amendment is drafted so that this guidance does not need to be statutory. It's already the case that this government have provided guidance to schools, to Scottish health boards. In fact, Scottish health boards have themselves issued a variety of guidance covering some of these issues. If that is possible, then it's completely within the Scottish Government's remit to publish guidance for devolved bodies, and I would argue that it would in fact be preferable. Graeme Simpson. I thank Jackie Bailey for taking the intervention. I've listened very carefully to her, as I always do. Um, and, uh, it sounds like the, these um, very sensible sounding amendments uh, in this group uh, are pretty fundamental to Labour's case. So if these amendments don't pass, particularly 130, will Labour not be supporting this bill? Jackie Bailey. Um, I absolutely welcome the intervention from Graham Simpson, but you know, I want to see these, these amendments passed. I hope everybody across this chamber listens to the very reasonable, proportionate arguments made and passes these amendments. And you can wait to stage three to find out what we do as a consequence of that. But, but I am confident that these amendments are competent. They will help to highlight that whilst this legislation simplifies the process of obtaining a GRC which is absolutely welcome. The rights of women, girls and trans people continue to be protected by equality legislation and that public authorities in Scotland will finally 
have clarity on the actions that they should take to ensure everyone's rights and obligations are upheld. Presiding officer, in bringing my remarks to a close, let me be clear on three things. Amendment 127 and indeed amendments 130 and 111 do not reinterpret the Equality Act. They state that it continues to apply in Scotland. That is a fact. The Scottish Government do not seem to have the same concerns about Amendment 130 and 111, so I would consider withdrawing Amendment 127 if they could find their way to supporting the other amendments and make that clear. Unfortunately, they haven't done so. So I would encourage members to think about this, because these amendments directly address the concerns of women and women's organisations while still protecting the rights of trans people seeking a gender recognition certificate. They deliver word for word the Equality Act provisions. They seek the practical provision of guidance where it would be a genuine dereliction of duty to leave a vacuum. They respond to the UN Rapporteur on Eliminating Violence for Women and Children's Concerns and I specifically asked if she would be reassured by these amendments and she said yes. We have responsibility as parliamentarians to ensure that we pass the best possible legislation. If we're serious about giving single-sex spaces protection whilst protecting the integrity of the bill, this is the opportunity to do so. Thank you. I now call Ash Regan to speak to Amendment 112 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, just the Chamber's information, I don't intend to lodge, uh, sorry, to move uh, 112, but I will move 113. So one of the roles of a government is obviously to protect its people. And the current GRA regime, um, as we all know, was put into place to ensure that legal recognition, to reflect that. And trans people are protected, uh, rightly so, under the Equality Act provision on gender reassignment. So the existing regime is fully compliant with human rights law. And a recent High Court Judicial Review in Northern Ireland ruled that the GRA regime strikes a fair balance between the needs of the applicant and the community as a whole. The bill before us today, in my view, does not strike that balance. It does not protect the rights of everyone. Instead, it introduces a hierarchy of rights where women's rights are demoted. And I say that not to be provocative or to be unnecessarily controversial, but because that is the only conclusion that can be drawn from a review of the interactions between these two pieces of legislation, I think demonstrated by the quite long debate we've had on that point prior to this. And the Court of Session ruling last week, in my view, has now put this beyond doubt. Self-ID does grant new rights as it will grant a GRC to almost anyone who wants one. And this is not just an administrative change. This is not just a change in process that has no real world effect. There are currently around 600 GRC holders in Scotland, which you know, is a quite a small number, and the government expects this to increase tenfold to 6,000. This will grant somewhere in the region of, although we're not entirely sure, 5,000 or more people who are, and the most important point about this, not currently eligible for a GRC, and also the rights that are conferred by it. Now, these people may well be trans. However, my strong contention is that not all of them will be. I'll give way. Maggie Chapman. I thank the member for, for giving way. When, when she says that these, the, the people, the 5,000, over 5,000 people are not currently eligible, does she accept that actually there will be people in that group that are eligible but have chosen not to go through the process because it is demeaning and humiliating? Ash Regan. Um, uh, excuse, excuse me, Ms Regan. I appreciate that there's great interest and that... Um, those observing from the gallery are very interested in the proceedings, but it is the case that uh, we would ask that, that members are not applauded from the gallery. Thank you. Ms Regan. Actually, I do accept that point. There probably will be some, uh, probably a small number, who have maybe chosen for you know, whatever reason that they don't want to apply for a GRC. But I still think the general contention is fair, that this opens the process up 
to a vast number of people who would not currently be eligible under the normal scheme with the safeguarding that I think that entails. And I also take issue with the point that the member raises, that all trans people think that the current process is intrusive or degrading in some way. Um, that is not, um, I'm sure some people do feel like that, but that is not um, how some trans people have described it to me. And one GRC holder said to, to me, that she was completely happy with the process and indeed felt that the longer process was entirely appropriate considering the profundity of the change that was being undertaken. So, if we are saying that we think that some of the people that are applying for GRC may not be trans, we're not going to be able to tell. We've had a debate on, on that already about how we would be able to tell if um, there were some fraudulent applications or not. And this now creates a situation where members of a dominant group in society can now self-identify into the rights of an oppressed group. And this is absolutely unprecedented. Now, my amendments in this group won't resolve this problem. And they won't put this beyond legal doubts, I don't think. I tried to lodge a number of other amendments, and I was um, advised by the Parliament that amendments that altered the effect of a GRC were inadmissible, and we've had um, some debate on that already. And, but I think that as the group of people that can now access the GRC is so expanded, and I think we're all admitting that it may be open to uh, being abused, that in not allowing this Parliament to make changes to the effect of a GRC, that we are now being asked to legislate in such a way that I don't think can possibly lead to good law. And therefore, it's my strong belief that many of the amendments that we are discussing today will not materially alter the issues that we are all facing. And I also contend that despite um, the information that's been presented to the committee that state's obligation to protect vulnerable rights holders was not given enough consideration. And that is, of course, a contention that has been backed up by Reem Al Salem, the UN Special, Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women. And it's claimed that the impact on women and girls had been assessed and that there was no impact. And I strongly disagree with that. I have searched and I cannot find the analysis that addresses and evaluates the impact from the context of women and girls as vulnerable rights holders. And that is consistent with other jurisdictions where the data on the impact on women is not being collected. In Ireland, when self-ID law was being reviewed, the impact on women was considered to be out of scope. But if you don't collect the data, you will not be able to assess the impact. And on that basis alone, I believe we should not be proceeding. There are many examples around the world of violent and sex offenders in women's prisons, now, of course, including here in Scotland. Examples of flashing and voyeurism in women's single sex spaces and women self-excluding from services in places where self-identification into women's single-sex spaces has introduced. And I assert that for those who are looking, the impact is there to see. And women's single-sex spaces are important. And the issue is whether, of course, people are male and not whether they are trans. Male people as a group are a risk to women. I see the Greens are sighing at that reference, but male people as a group are a risk to women and I think we all accept that. So the ability to exclude people of the opposite sex if they hold a GRC I think will now be impossible on grounds of sex and inevitably making use of these exemptions will be much more complicated and it will be much more off-putting to organisations, many of which are quite small, some are charities and so on. So this bill may not spell it out, but I believe that we shouldn't delude ourselves. It comprehensively undermines the single sex exemptions. And we're being conditioned to accept male bodied people in women's single sex spaces. Why? Who does that benefit? And I would say to my fellow parliamentarians that it boils down to this. Do you think women will be more or less safe as a result of this law? And if you have any doubt, any doubt at all, 
that it will make women and girls less safe, then you cannot vote for it. Yes. Bravo. And I... We will suspend for a moment. I would just remind As parliamentarians, the public expect us to engage critically with the arguments. They expect us to balance different viewpoints and rights. And they expect us to ask the hard questions and understand what we are voting for. And it is a huge responsibility, and it cannot be delegated. The people of Scotland are watching. And we often say that we use legislation to send a message. And I believe that's true. I believe that is sometimes what we're doing. But I'm very, very sad to say that the message today that's been sent out to women and girls in Scotland is that you don't matter. So I'm going to vote as if women do matter and I'll be voting against the bill. Thank you. Um, before I call um, Pauline McNeill to speak, under Rule 9.8.5a, I am minded to accept a motion without notice to propose that the next time limit be extended to two hours. Move, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the time limit by which the debate on groups 13 and 14 must end be extended by two hours. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed, and I call Pauline McNeill to speak to Amendment 117 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I speak to Amendment 117 in my name, 128, 129, supporting the excellent amendments in the name of Jack Bailey and others in the group. I'll try not to repeat what's been said, but there's obviously quite a bit of overlap in this group. It's probably one of the most important groups, groupings, I think, of the bill itself. So I want to begin with tackling the issue of the Scottish Government's position that all they have done is reform the process, part of the 2004 Gender Recognition Act. I don't believe that that is the case. The Scottish Government has consistently argued, therefore, there is no requirement to issue guidance or clarify the effect of holding a gender recognition certificate under the proposed reforms in relation to the 2010 Equality Act. In fact, the Scottish Government have insisted right up to this point that it is the responsibility, and you heard that again today, of the Equality and Human Rights Commission to issue guidance on the effect of having a gender recognition certificate. The problem with that statement is that the Equality and Human Rights Commission, as Claire Baker mentioned earlier, have then and now repeated their view that the government has amended the bill to such an extent that there now needs to be clarity on the operation of the 2010 Equality Act. Now, in my view, this is based on the fact that the, the 2022 bill, as we are looking at now, is quite different. Just last week, again, they said the same. The law concerning matters of sex and gender can be complex and clarity is essential for public bodies, employers, service providers and people across the country who rely on it. Again, Reem Asalam, who gave evidence to the Equality and Human Rights Committee, said the same. She said to the Cabinet Secretary in relation to prisons, she said the guidance is not good enough. Now, what more convincing did the government really need to get to this stage and argue that you have now conceded that you will then talk, now talk to them? I'll give way to Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Polly McNeill might be aware, uh, I'm not sure, that the, the prison service is already uh, reviewing its guidance, um, or, but have been managing transgender prisoners for many years, some of which uh, are placed uh, in the women's estate, some in the men's estate, according to risk. But yet she is aware that they are reviewing their guidance to make sure it's, it's fit for purpose uh, in the, the current uh, day. Polly McNeill. Yes, and I do welcome that review um, from the Scottish Prison Service, and they have consulted more widely, and I'm pleased 
to see that. But I, I'm not comfortable with the notion that this is now for consultation. Why we're still being criticised as the Parliament for not having the guidance in the first place. That makes me uncomfortable with looking at the provisions in the bill while this is not in place. Because it's a central issue to be debated in this grouping. Uh, Jackie Bailey has addressed also, uh, and that is the confusion at Ruth Maguire's question about funders, for example. There is massive confusion. I want to address this in some detail, if you don't mind. Under the current and proposed system, so it now appears uh, that it's quite impossible for organisations to legally distinguish between those born females and holders of a female GRC. And the government successfully argued this in court. Uh, and I, I think that um, whilst that judgment may be overturned or not, it, it has added to the confusion about this particular aspect, particularly of this phrase, legal sex. Now, this will undoubtedly lead to confusion of the organisations that are left with the challenge of trying to interpret what that law means. So in stage two, the briefing of the Equality Human Rights Committee noted that the perforce form will have significant implications for the equality, uh, operation of the Equality Act in Scotland, to the extent that they say the expansion to a larger group will have meaningful consequences in relation to the operation of those provisions. So I don't think that members should dismiss it lightly that whatever you think of the reforms, this particular reform will apply to a larger group of people. And we have the, the, the guardians of the Equality Act. I mean, let's be clear, the Equality and Human Rights Commission are the guardians, if you like, of the Equality Act, are saying um, that that makes a significant difference and has meaningful consequences, they say, in relation to education and schools, sex discrimination, including equal pay between men and women, gender pay gaps, and measures to address the disadvantages experienced by women. And my contention in this bill is it does not simply just reform that part of the 2004 Act, which I was a vocal supporter of, and still am a vocal supporter of reform. Um, but I, I believe that by, by removing huge elements of the process and arriving at a, pros, uh, if you like, a, a, a framework now which is a self-ID model, then the operation of the Equality Act does leave some things to be considered. And this is what I'm going to... Yes, I will, yeah. Thank Chris you, White. Pauline McNeil. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the member agree with Joanne Lamont when she says that the proposed safeguards are utterly risable? Thank you. Pauline McNeill. Well, I think what the Parliament has been trying to achieve, actually, to be fair, in the last day or so, is actually to debate some of the safeguards and some of which I think we have achieved. So, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, but uh, I wasn't really talking about safeguards, per se. I think this is a really, really important... It's certainly a really important point for me um, because... My contention, as I said, is the bill doesn't simply just reform one part of the GRA. It actually kind of changes the whole nature of it, which is why we as legislators have got to be clear now that if we pass the bill tomorrow, tonight, tomorrow, whenever that's going to be, um, that we are pretty clear, absolutely clear, how it interacts with the Equality Act. I believe that... Give me, just give me a minute to get my train of thought back, please. Um, I believe that the Scottish Government have instead stripped out these elements, as I've said. So if we, uh, plus, removing all the requirements from the process of acquiring a gender, as I spoke to in previous groupings, also means that there's some clarity required. So I believe that's why the Scottish Government must publish detailed guidance on the effect of having a GRC. And I want to speak more to this about what there might be legal challenges to Lady Haldane's judgment and what it might mean. So I, I do think that uh, given what I've just described, which is a vastly different bill, it's not just a tinkering with 2004, then I think the obligation is for the government now to indicate what the effect of having a gender recognition certificate is. I give way to Rachel Hamilton. Rachel Hamilton. I oh, thank Pauline McNeill for allowing me in. Um, I'm really interested in the arguments that you're making, and you and I have discussed this issue. Through the chair, uh, please, Rachel Hamilton. Sorry, presiding officer, but I just want to ask Pauline McNeill if she believes that the Lady Haldane's court ruling that um, Pauline McNeill is talking about has blown apart the SNP claim that obtaining a GRC does not grant access to the rights and protections of women because the, their argument, the, the argument that the SNP made in court, um, now confers access to the rights and provisions 
um, and rights and protections to women. So they've blown apart their own argument by arguing against that it doesn't confer rights and protections to women. Polly McNeill. Oh, OK. I, I'm not going to second guess the judgment and what might happen, but I want to say this in response. I was going to say anyway. Um, so so the, the phrase we've heard, nothing in this bill changes anything in the Equality Act. Now, that really depends what your perspective is, in a sense. Because for me, I've always assumed the Equality Act, when it refers to sex, although it doesn't say so, I've always assumed it means biological sex. But for some people, they think it's legal sex. And what Lady Haldane seems to be saying is that's legal sex. Up to this point, I thought it was biological sex. My point is, it's a lot, there's a great deal of confusion on what this judgment now means. So that is, I guess, my point, which is, for, it's, the, it's the government's job, who are the movers of the legislation, to take into consideration the judgment and to tell providers and the general public what the effect of having a GRC is. I can't answer what the effect is because I'm a wee bit confused myself, to be honest now. I want to deal with this question of having a GRC, not having a GRC. So we've heard, heard this argument, well, you can, it doesn't really make any difference whether you have one or whether you don't because you can be excluded um, under the exemptions. Um, now, so the, I think there is a significant level of confusion um, about this, um, and it does take time to get your head around this, about where, 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 where this really does uh, matter. Um, so in March of this year, Cabinet Secretary uh, said that the bill does not introduce any new rights for trans people. It's about simplifying and improving the process for a trans person to gain legal recognition. So, so I do agree that it does make the process simple. Uh, what I'm not clear about is whether it gives any new rights or not. Now, I did want to say something else in relation to the Haldane judgment. Um, there are many commentators already saying that the, the four women Scotland a judgment would be likely to destabilise existing categories and frameworks for the purposes of, res of reserve matters and equal opportunities. And a particular article by Michael Foran, who writes for the UK Constitutional Law Association. Now, I realise it's just one academic, but this has been discussed, obviously, since this judgment was only passed on the 13th of December. Um, but here's the important part, I think, for the government to consider. He and others are of now of the opinion that the possession of a GRC clearly does matter for the assessment of whether exclusion is objectively justified. Now, I'll deal with this argument in a minute, and it's one that Jackie Bailey made very well, which is the, the law requires you to judge whether or not it's proportionate and legitimate to exclude anyone, and rightly so. You have to see why you think it's proportionate. Some commentators are saying that given we've just had this judgment, what we don't know is that the possession of a GRC is going to be make it potentially more difficult to make that objective judgment. Now, I'm only posing the question. I'm not saying that it is. If you give me a second, I will, uh, because, because I want to make this point thoroughly. I'm not saying that it will, but the fact that people are already questioning the judgment in this regard, and given that it's the government that have in a sense, got to answer this question because you're the ones that are saying, no problem here, it's, it will be totally in line with the Equality Act and you can use the exemptions. While some people are now saying, well, having a GRC may, make, may, may be not be seen as objective to exclude somebody who has one. I'll give way to Jeremy Balfour. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Would remember, agree with me, we've had this judgment for just over a week. Uh, most of us haven't read the full judgment let alone understood it. Academics are still working through the implications of it. Uh, no doubt lawyers are looking at appeal points as well. So there is real uncertainty of what this interpretation will mean going forward. Would she not agree with me that actually the best way forward here would be simply to pause the process until we get some legal certainty so we're not all trying to second guess well, most of us aren't practising day-to-day lawyers. Polly McNeill. Well, I think it's a fair point that none of us are practising day-to-day lawyers. We're trying to make our best understanding of it. But what I'm saying is, that's my understanding. But I would like guidance from the government in terms of, they're the movers of the legislation. I, I, I'm really trying to get that now and not wait, which is why I've moved these amendments. And I want to deal with the exceptions in the 2010 Equality Act, again, that Jackie Bailey um, addressed, because they are so fundamentally important, I think, to this legislation. Um, 
and that is Amendment 129, requiring the Scottish Government to consult each public authority about the implications of this Act for the development and modification of the authority's policy on the operation of the exclusions. So in December 2021, just a year ago, the House of Commons uh, Women and Equalities Committee reported on the Gender Recognition State Act stated that concerns raised about the interplay between the Gender Reform Act and the Equality Act fell into three broad categories. One, a lack of confidence or understanding among service providers about how to apply exceptions. Two, the need for better guidance to assist service providers with exceptions. And three, how a system of self-declaration might affect the provision of single-sex services. In a, in a year on from this, I don't think these questions have been answered. And fundamentally, this is the most important point I'd like to make to the Cabinet Secretary. If service providers don't feel they have confidence to use the law, what is the point of the law? And I think, again, you must provide these organisations with that confidence, or I don't think you can continue to rely on this issue that you can just organisations can just make use of. And I want to, I want to draw some examples to, 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 on that point. And so, I, you, you, Cabinet Secretary is aware. I've been trying to get a copy of this letter that Pam Duncan Glancy raised earlier for ages um, to see what was actually in it and I do concede at the time I wasn't I did see on the record that I could only read the Times report but I read it for myself and I accept the letter is quite different but what concerns me about Kevin Stewart's letter and it illustrates my point which is he wrote the health boards in October of this year, noting that he had been asked questions about the processes and policies Scottish hospitals were using when managing inpatient admissions of transgender patients to NHS inpatient services, and that some boards had clarified that there is no, currently no specific protocol for the management of this patient group. There is nothing in the letter about the law. Nothing in the letter about the exemptions. Now, surely at least the government would accept. Uh, what's the point in writing to health boards without telling what they're allowed to do, but putting the onus on them when actually it's the government? I really think this is I think it's atrocious, to be honest. And I think the government have got to, to live up to the responsibilities here and say, well, that's why I ask that the government support my amendment and talk to organisations on the ground who have to implement this public policy. I mean, I, I think this is the most lacking aspect of the legislation's impact, and that is the public policy uh, sphere, if you like, about how you apply these exemptions. Um, public... Yes, I will, yeah. Cabinet Secretary. So, Polly McNeill will be aware um, that the EHRC recently issued revised guidance, and I think that was partly to take into account some of the issues that Polly McNeill is uh, talking about. So, I'm not sure what different guidance we would provide in those circumstances, because actually I think the revised guidance is the right guidance. And to cut across that, even if we could, and we can't because it's reserved, would just cause confusion. Is, I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with the revised guidance that the HRC have issued. I wonder then if the Cabinet Secretary would address my central point then, which is, why do ministers not write to health boards and tell them what the guidance is? Why are you writing to health boards and putting the onus on them to tell you? Because here's the problem. Here's the problem. They don't have the confidence to use it. And I want to give another example of this. In Ayrshire and Arran, there's policy on trans users. There appears to be no mention of the exemptions framework. Can you see the trend here? No one in public, uh, the public sector is mentioning the exemption. I don't understand why the government are not more concerned about this. Because it's, it really is in the interest of all users. It's in the interest of trans patients. It's in the interest of all patients. It's the interest, if you believe in the policy and the legislation, to sort this out. And, and this is the worst example because it's a total misreading of the law. It isn't even the law. The NHS policy in Asia and refers to multiple occasions the fact that certain scenarios or practices may be in breach of the legislation. They don't name the legislation. In Appendix 4, this policy states that placing a trans patient in a single occupancy room to avoid potential difficulties is discriminatory. 
While it's only discriminatory if they have not justified it by being proportionate and legitimate, compared to the situation they say of placing a black, disabled, elderly or lesbian and gay bisexual patient in a single occupancy room. And the policy further states that female patients who raise concerns about trans women being put on female hospital wards were comparable with races and they have been told that they will be removed. Now, look, I, I'm not being too hard on the health board here because I think they probably think they are trying to do the right thing, but this is a disaster in public policy terms. So why have, I'm really actually quite annoyed we got to stage three before the government's acknowledging any of this. I want to close the single sex services and the Jackie Bailey uh, did uh, two seconds. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, Liam Kerr. Uh, I'm very grateful and may I say I'm enjoying the member's contribution. I think she articulates my concerns as well very uh, well. So, but it does lead me to wonder if the member doesn't get the amendment sought today and the clarifications that have been asked for from the Cabinet Secretary and so the ambiguity and concerns that she's articulated remain. Does the member nevertheless intend to vote for the bill? And if so, can she help me understand why? Well, well, any good legislator, I am, I have come here today to really press the cabinet secretary for some answers. So, and actually, I, I sat through the whole of the stage too. I mean, I, I, my contribution to this is, is very genuine. What I'll do uh, when the time comes is something you'll find out because I, at the moment, am really trying to test the government on these important policy issues. I want to improve the, uh, I want to improve the situation. Um, probably Jackie Bailey has covered the issue of single-sex services, um, so I won't... Uh, it was just a, just a reiteration of some of the services, such as rape, rape uh, crisis centres have clearly found it very difficult in some instances, and I don't think that's good enough. It's not good enough for rape crisis centres to feel the threat of being called transphobic for using the exemptions, where they can clearly show that it's proportionate and legitimate. The government must stand up for these services who choose to do that. Um, lastly, um, my amendment on de sex and gender, um, I just wanted to talk about this briefly. I, I, I think we need better data. I, I think that the, um, the UN rapporteur and uh, LGBTI, uh, forgive me, I can't remember his name, it made this point quite well, that, that, that we do need to have more data on the, uh, population, the trans population to ensure we've got better policies affecting uh, them. But we do need to collect data on the basis of biological sex. Uh, Reem Azalem says that she says that she's afraid that the collection of sex and data has been recently deprioritised and she says it's led to the conflation of uh, data results. Um, so we've seen the introduction of recording policies that conflate sex and gender identity in a single category. And whilst I recognise the Chief Statistician published a report on data collection in respect of sex and gender identity and trans status in September 2021, he proposed voluntary questions around the capture of sex and gender. And it's clear many organisations are not tracking such information in relation to service users. Uh, statistical evidence has been compromised by a lack of separate data on sex and gender identity, meaning information can be easily tracked. Uh, police and other services need to collect data on sex and birth declared gender identity separately in order for services to undertake rigorous risk and impact assessments when considering proportion and legitimate uh, concerns. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I apologise that was a long contribution. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I wanted this moved into another uh, grouping so that I could address it. Uh, in conclusion, I am clear in my own mind that if, we want the, if you want the legislation to work, it is quite different. You have to resolve these issues without going to the heart of competency. You have to sit, you have to give confidence to public service providers. Otherwise, as Jackie Bailey says, the term proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim is an absolutely meaningless phrase in law if you cannot tell your public sector providers what it actually means in the first place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms McNeill. I now call Claire Baker to speak to Amendment Point of Order, Douglas Lumsden. While the debate has been taking place, I notice there are members at home trying to make interventions, but speakers aren't able to see that um, while they're speaking. 
Are you able to tell us, or are, are they meant to be told that there's interventions, or are they just meant to notice that on the screen while they're, while they're, while they're speaking? I, can I thank Douglas Lumsden for that? Uh, I was not aware of that. I will uh, ask for that to be looked into. Certainly, it should be the case that those who are participating remotely should be able to make that clear to members who are speaking in the chamber. But I'll ask for that to be looked into. Thank you very much, Mr Lumsden. Uh, I now call Claire Baker to speak to Amendment 118 and other amendments in the group. Ms Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. So, Amendments 118 and 119 in this group focus on the need for guidance on the operation of occupational exceptions, which considers Section 22 of the 2004 Gender Recognition Act and Schedule 9 of the 2010 Equality Act. So, Section 22 of the Gender Recognition Act 2004 makes the disclosure of protected information related to an individual's trans status a criminal offence unless it is to prevent a crime. And Schedule 9 of the Equality Act 2010 allows occupational exceptions based on both gender reassignment and sex when it is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. So at stage two, I secured an amendment which has been incorporated into Amendment 90 uh, today, which requires the government to consider the need for further exceptions to the offences under Section 22 in devolved areas. And if they decide not to, they have to specify why not. And amendments 118 and 119 complement this as they address the issue of guidance. Um, President Officer, I had intended to bring forward amendments which would have given opportunity to debate the appropriateness of Section 22 of the 2004 Act, if the offence should be civil rather than criminal, if malicious intent should be identified, for example. But these were ruled to be out with scope. And that is why I find the debate around the Equality Act challenging. The Government is correct that the Bill is not adding or taking away any rights for trans people, but they do not recognise or think it is relevant that the significant changes being proposed to the process changes the context in which those rights are being granted. The rights contained in the 2004 Act and being upheld in the 2010 Act by the EHRC and the ruling from Lady Haldane reflected a social contract between the individual and society. It has been described as a key to a lock. I appreciate this bill moves the process in another direction. This bill is about the individual making the decision alone. And while the argument impact, and with the argument, it, there's an argument that it impacts on no one or it concerns no one else. But by making the changes to this process, the rights afforded by the 2004 Act will be extended to a potentially very different cohort of people as the process is being made simpler and easier, demedicalised and less bureaucratic. And in this context, we need to have clarity over the operation of the exemptions and exceptions in the Equality Act. So the 2010 Equality Act facilitates the delivery of single-sex services when it is proportionate and legitimate. But the current lack of clarity is leading to confusion over how the law is interpreted. This confusion is there both for providers of such facilities and for users being aware of what they can or cannot expect or what they are entitled to expect under existing equality legislation. In the 2019 consultation on the draft Gender Recognition Reform Bill, the Scottish Government themselves highlighted a situation which requires clarity. The consultation said that some people in an organisation, for example in the HR department, may know about a person's trans history, but those actually taking the decisions on staff deployment, for example line managers, may not. The consultation goes on to say that when there is a legitimate case to use the general occupational exemption, it would be appropriate for information about a person's trans history to be shared in a strictly limited, proportionate and legitimate way. However, it is not clear how this statement can be made in relation to Section 22 of the 2004 Act, which makes it a criminal offence to share protected information. This has led to confusion from employers and in public bodies. For example, a Scottish Health Board and an FOI said unless the practitioner consented to exclude them from carrying out female-only care would be a breach of Section 22 of the Gender Recognition Act 2004 and a criminal offence. There are also restrictions under the Equality Act 2010 around requiring staff to disclose their gender identity and staff selection on this basis. Um, President Officer, this is not accurate. A health board can exclude on the basis of gender assignment regardless of whether or not someone holds a GRC. They can exclude someone from delivering female-only care under the 2010 Equality Act.
The lack of clarity around the effect of Section 22 is having a chilling effect. It suggests that public bodies believe that Section 22 prohibits information to the extent it prevents them from delivering female-only care, although the government consultation in 2019 said that information can be shared. So I believe it is incumbent on the government to provide guidance on occupational exemptions to service providers, which clearly sets out the interaction between this piece of legislation, Section 22 of the 2004 Act and Schedule 9 of the Equality Act. While the Equality and Human Rights Commission have issued guidance on occupational requirement and exceptions, the interpretation of that guidance in public bodies across Scotland continues to lead to confusion. I do not believe that it is out with the boundaries of the Scottish Government's powers to provide clarity on these issues. In their briefing for the stage two of the bill, as I said earlier, the EHRC said in relation to the UK and Scottish Governments, they must ensure clarity for employer and service providers on the law. The Scottish Government should recognise their responsibility to provide guidance which employers could use on the occasions that they wish to exercise an occupational exemption, which they are able to do with the support of the Equality Act when it is proportionate for legitimate aim. It would also provide clarity for service users and it would emphasise the EHRC guidance and make it clear the circumstances in which they can expect an occupational exemption to be considered. This would provide much needed clarity for the provision of single sex services. I would ask members to support Amendment 118 as it requires the guidance to be subject to parliamentary approval. This is a complex area that I think would benefit from parliamentary scrutiny and 118 would provide for that. So we have a number of amendments before us today on guidance, most of which I understand the government um, aren't going to support. So, President Officer, I've got two final points. One is, if the government's guidance, which is Amendment 54, will not cover the areas the MSPs are raising, can they clarify which areas will be covered by their guidance? And secondly, I was struck by uh, the UN Special Reporter on Violence Against Women and Girls, the evidence she gave to the Equalities Committee on Monday. And here I'm going to highlight her views on the shortcomings of guidance. She said... She said it would be helpful to issue guidance, but frankly, on its own, that is not enough. That would be a bandaged solution to wider and more systematic flaws with the process and the draft legislation as it stands. I suggest again we go back and address all these different pieces because they're all linked to each other and that we do not suggest this would be a magical solution to some of these issues as a result of non-binding guidance. Some things must be clarified and spelled out in law. That is what women's organisations and many victims expect. My amendments are asking for guidance and I think this would improve the implementation of the bill and I am urging members to support it, but I have to say I am concerned that guidance will not resolve the challenging issues that myself and others have raised this afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Baker. I now call Rachel Hamilton to speak to move Amendment uh, 120 and other amendments in the group. Ms. Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move the amendment in my name. My amendments in this group would place two requirements on ministers that I believe offer them an opportunity to clarify the interaction between this bill and the protection of single sex spaces and provide reassurance to both providers and users of those spaces. Amendment 120 requires ministers to provide and publish guidance on how this bill will affect single sex services, whilst Amendment 121 requires ministers to prepare and publish a report on the impact of this Act on the provision of single sex services. These amendments aim to provide clarity on the operation of single sex exemptions within the 2010 Equality Act for the providers of single <laughs> sex spaces in relation to this bill. Um, many people have quoted uh, Rima Salem today, the UN Special Reporter on Violence Against Women and Girls, and she provided um, evidence to committee on these matters. And she said that women could self-exclude from female-only spaces as a result of this uh, bill. So far, women have received absolutely no reassurance from the Cabinet Secretary that their rights will be protected within this bill. The debate around this has been, I believe, repeatedly shut down and brushed aside. Mr. Salem also said, sorry, do you want to make an intervention? No, oh, right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Salem said that the Scot... Sorry, do you want to make an intervention? Could no, front benches no. Mr. Salem said speaking that across Scottish the chamber, uh, Ms. Hamilton? Ms Hamilton, could you, Ms Hamilton, could you resume your, could you resume your seat, please? 
Ms Hamilton, could I ask you to resume your seat, please? Could I invite Mr Brown and Mr Finlay to desist from speaking across the chamber while Ms Hamilton is speaking? We have conducted this debate so far in a courteous and respectful manner and expect the Chamber to continue in that fashion. With that, I invite Ms Hamilton to resume your remarks. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Mr Salem said that the Scottish Government's proposals would open the door for violent males who identify as men to abuse the process of acquiring a GRC and the rights associated with it, and that the Scottish Government does not provide for any safeguarding measures to ensure that the procedure is not, as far as can be reasonably assured, abused by sexual predators and other perpetrators of violence. These include access to both single-sex spaces and gender-based spaces. Today, the Scottish Government have failed to provide clarity and reassurance to provide many of us who are asking and users of single-sex spaces, despite the many opportunities that have been presented to them to do so, and the out-of-hand um, rejection of a number of <coughs> colleagues uh, who have continued to push this concern that they have that's not represented by them it's represented by others out with this building out with this chamber people who are uh, very concerned um, I also want to highlight evidence that was taken by the committee from the HRC and many members of the public <coughs> MBM and others who express similar views that this issue must be addressed in the bill I want to commend Ash Reagan, Jackie Bailey, Pauline McNeill and Claire Baker for their contributions. Um, we will be supporting all the amendments um, that they have put forward. And I'm not going to repeat many of their very clear arguments that they have um, articulated very well. But um, in her closing, I would like um, to address some of the issues that haven't been addressed today, which... Um, are the, as the impact of uh, Lady Haldane's ruling and I would like the Cabinet Secretary to tell me how um, protections on the basis of sex are impacted by Lady Haldane's court ruling. For example, can a woman raise a sex discrimination case if their comparator is a male who has a, a female GRC or the positive measures by all of us here in a cross chamber? Um, who want to reach gender balance in public boards. And does the Haldane ruling mean that gender balance on a public board could be 50% men and 50% trans women, effectively extinguishing the hard-fought protections of women? Thank you, presiding officer. I think I moved my amendment. Uh, you don't need to move it at this oh, stage anyway, okay. Ms. Hamilton, oh, but I'm much obliged. Thank you. Um, uh, before moving to the, the next uh, speaker, can I just respond uh, more fully to Mr Lumsden's earlier point of order? Thank you again uh, for raising it. Uh, I've asked officials to check they have confirmed, as indeed as broadcasting, that the uh, remote uh, system is working as appropriate. It does, however, rely on members um, noticing uh, this appearing on the screen. Uh, and therefore, uh, it's maybe a useful reminder that there will be members uh, who are participating remotely who may, may wish to make an intervention. And therefore, if a colleagues could be aware of that, um, I think that would be helpful. Uh, with that, I uh, move to Pam Gosell to speak to Amendment 61 and other amendments in the group. Ms Gosell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Firstly, like others, I would like to thank all the organisations who have sent briefings through to help inform this debate. I would also like to thank all the hundreds of emails and letters and cards we have received, which I am sure everybody has received in this chamber. And lastly, before I start my uh, amendment, the debate, I wanted to thank all the parliamentary staff for uh, obviously last night staying on. But looking at the time, I think I'm going to uh, thank them ahead of time. That looks like we will be here again in another late night. So thank you. Since day one, I have made it clear that my goal is here to seek balance. No good legislation ever comes from betraying the rights of one group to the convenience of another. In other words, while I truly believe that improvements to the gender recognition process would be beneficial for trans individuals, this should not come at the expense of women and girls, vulnerable individuals and children who require the protection of the law. At stage two of the bill, my colleagues and I try to make amendments to uphold some form of safeguarding against bad faith actors which are not included in the SNP government's flawed legislation. We even tried to postpone this legislation, given the evidence that 
came to light in the form of recent ruling by the Scottish Supreme Civil Court. Further damning evidence outlined in a letter from the United Nations Special Rapporteur on violence against women. And most recently, polling which suggests two-thirds of Scottish electorate opposes the key principles of this bill. But clearly, the Scottish Government is charging ahead and not listening to many voices pleading for this bill to be postponed. Yeah. Uh, John Mason. Uh, I thank the member for giving way. I mean, so far her remarks have been quite general, but does she think that self-exclusion might particularly impact on ethnic minority women and people from religious minorities? Pam Gosal. I thank the member for um, asking that question. Absolutely, it will affect, and you will see some of my uh, amendments later on, how I talk about that. I have mentioned it many times in the committees, but I have also mentioned it many times in this chamber, that we must have a balanced right for everybody. And coming from a BAME background, I will be speaking about this and letters we have received. So I hope the member will be eager to listen later on. Thank you. Today I stand here hoping the Parliament will support my amendments, which seek to offer even just minimum reassurances for women that this Parliament is committed to upholding their rights. At this stage in the process, it has come down to making minor amendments in the hope that there will be at least be some form of reassurance for women, some form of comfort that their rights are under the 2010 Equality Act and not being completely eroded. At stage two, I propose amendments which would have required Scottish ministers to publish information on the impact of the Act on single sex spaces and services. Yes, to no surprise, they were voted down. At stage three today, I ask that Parliament supports my amendments 61 and 20, uh, 123. Amendment 61 places a requirement on ministers to prepare and publish a report on the impact of this Act on self-inclusion from activities or services no later than one year after Section 2 comes into force. I ask that the report includes information on self-inclusion by both women and men and in different activities or services. Amendment 123 places a requirement on ministers to prepare a, and publish a report on the impact of this Act on funding for single-sex services and to consider what steps, if any, the Scottish Government consider necessary to ensure appropriate funding is available to single-sex services. Presiding officer, for years this Parliament has been making genuine progress in its attempts to ensure that victims feel heard, to ensure they have a safe space to ensure they have the support network. But this bill risks doing that the opposite. It risks marginalising already marginalised women. It risks re-traumatising victims. Yeah. Vulnerable women, particularly victims of domestic violence, may forego seeking refuge in domestic abuse shelters, whereby they might encounter biological males. This amendment therefore calls for data collection to obtain a figure on how many women are excluding themselves for such activities. This is highlighted by the fact single-sex victim support services are so few and far between that Vera's Place, which opens its doors last week, is set to be the sole single-sex support service for victims of sexual violence in Scotland's capital. It begs the question, why does it take the feminists like JK Rowling to step in and provide a solution to an identified problem while the SNP government sits on its hands and denies such problems exist? On Monday at committee, I asked Reem Asaleem, the United Nations Special Rapporteur, whether given that ring-fencing funding was out with the scope of the bill. The next best option was to place a requirement on ministers to re review the impact of the bill on funding for single-sex services. <coughs> Mrs Asaleem agreed that placing this requirement on ministers would be justified. I also refer you to her letter from Mrs Asaleem 
where she writes, in the case of Scotland, it has been difficult to determine the exact scale of self-exclusion. Given that hard and comprehensive data is lacking for several compelling reasons, she later says, General recommendation number 20 makes it clear that in complying with this obligations, their obligations to eliminate discrimination against women under Article 2 of the Convention of the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, state parties should provide for mechanisms that collect relevant sex disaggregated data, enable effective monitoring, facilitate continuing evaluation and allow for the revision of supplementation of existing measures and the identification of any new measures that may be appropriate. Presiding officer, it is vital that service providers in Scotland are enabled to provide single sex services. While Reem Asaleem believes funding must be ring fenced for a certain proportion to be single sex, to balance the needs of different demographics without placing them in conflict. I was told that ring fence for a certain proportion of single sex and gender based services out of scope of this bill. She did make it clear, however, that it is not our job to question why some women want to access to women only spaces, but it is our job as a state, as states and as organisations to reduce the barriers for access, and this is what is required by an intersectional approach. Therefore, I propose that the Scottish Government, at the very least, monitor and review the impact of this Act on self-inclusion and funding for single-sex services. I would urge all members to back Amendment 61 and 123 in my name. I, of course, support other amendments such as 111, 120, 121, 72, 73, 127, 130 and 92, which seek guidance on and the protection of single sex spaces and services. I also support amendments 117, 128 and 133, which seek guidance on the effect of this Act, how GRC impact the Equality Act 2010. I will also be supporting Amendment 112, which states that this Act does not affect the provisions in Gender Recognition Act 2004. I also support Amendments 118 and 119, which requires ministers to issue guidance on the disclosure of protected information related to GRCs for the purpose of occupational requirements. I also lend my support to amendments and 129 and 136, which seek to consult interest groups such as public authorities and women and girls. However, I will, not be, voted, I will be voting against the Amendment 54 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, which requires ministers to consult and provide guidance on this Act to bodies they deem to be promoting equality and human rights because ultimately it's clear that from this consultation on this bill alone many groups remain feeling unheard so how i do not have that so i do not have that complete faith that the scottish government will consult on a fair basis Thank you, Ms. Gosal. Um, I understand my earlier response to Mr. Lumsden's um, point of order wasn't entirely audible in other parts of the chamber, wasn't picked up by the microphone. So just to clarify, um, the system for remote interventions is working, uh, but it does require members um, to be keeping half an eye on the screen. Um, so I hope that reassurance is helpful and um, I think entirely appropriately and timely. The next speaker is Sue Webber to speak to Amendment 72 and other amendments in the group. And Sue Webber joins us remotely. Ms. Webber. If you could hold on a second, Ms. Weber, um, the audio doesn't appear to be working. I'll have a, uh, we'll investigate that and uh, try and get you up and running as soon as possible.
Is that one better? That is, that is much better, Miss Webber. Fix it myself. There you go. Right. Thank you very much, presiding officer. And uh, yes, thank you for bearing with me with those interventions I was trying to get in previously. I have four amendments in this group which seek to compel Scottish ministers to provide clarity to women and girls about when services can be single sex and when they cannot. Pretty much the practical operations of the bill. Amendments 72, 73 and 74 seek to do this through Scottish government issued guidance while Amendment 92 seeks to enshrine this through secondary legislation. So I move the amendments in my name. Starting with the guidance amendments, Amendment 72 sets out a duty for Scottish ministers to provide guidance in, to, in relation to service providers being able to offer their service exclusively to those who are female at birth, irrespective of whether their person has a gender recognition certificate. And now we've all heard today that the recent Court of Session ruling confirms that under uh, the Gender Recognition Act 2004, an individual obtaining a gender recognition certificate has their sex changed for all purposes, including under the Equality Act. However, we have heard consistently and continue to do so today that the Scottish Government appears to maintain that this does not apply to the provision of certain single-sex spaces. And if that is the case, it would be very useful for them to highlight in which circumstance it is still lawful to exclusively provide a space or service just to those who were born female. For example, a domestic abuse charity or indeed for somebody to request that a service be exclusively provided by someone who was born female like a carer. I mean, I have received correspondence from a severely disabled female who relies on extremely intimate care, intimate personal care, and she would like to ensure that her carer was born female. So we need to understand how this would transpire so she can maintain her dignity. After all, she's entitled to this too. The bill retains the purpose of the original Gender Recognition Act 2004, so the effect of obtaining a gender recognition certificate is the same in law. The public deserve clarity over when it is lawful to either provide or request services exclusively for women who are female at birth. And Pauline McNeil has spoken about the confidence that the public are needing and the current confusion that is existing. So that is why I have another Amendment 73, which specifically compels Scottish ministers to provide guidance as to how this bill will interact with the exceptions that are outlined in Schedule 3 of the Equality Act. It's of no use for SNP ministers saying that the bill will have no impact on the exemptions in the Equality Act, when stakeholders have been very clear that they are unsure how these exemptions apply to their specific organisation. So perhaps when the Cabinet Secretary responds to this today, she can name examples of where it is proportionate to discriminate against those with a GRC for the purpose of providing a single sex service, because the current providers do not have this information. And legislation, after all, we're sitting here, some of us in a state of confusion, is never written in a language that most people or organisations can interpret without lawyers and therefore share, their, share with their service users or indeed customers. Language that explains in plain English what it means to them specifically and importantly in practice. The Cabinet Secretary insists that the guidance is clear but I'd suggest it's the very opposite, given the interventions in the Chamber that make it clear that this is not the case. Organisations, public, private and third sector, need clear guidance which they can trust is lawful, telling them that they can still provide single-sex spaces or services. And that is what Amendment 74 aims to achieve. The guidance should be as comprehensive as possible, covering as many different organisations that will have to confront the problem of whether they are legally allowed to exclude those with a gender recognition certificate from accessing female-only services. And the, uh, any ambiguity must be removed. Pauline McNeil spoke about that in was NHS Ayrshire and Aaron. If I get the health board wrong, uh, apologies, I was kicked out for a moment. And my last amendment, Amendment 92, offers the government, the Scottish Government, an alternative path to achieving the goal that I seek, although it's not contradictory with my earlier amendments, and both can be passed. Instead of producing guidance, 
Amendment 92 would, as part of the regulations commenced in Section 2 of the Bill, require those regulations to set out to the service providers and users what they are lawfully able to provide or request service for those who are female at birth only. We are here to make good law, and as part of that, we have to provide certainty to the public about the legal implications of all legislation that passes through this chamber. Ambiguity must be removed. And I, not do, I do not believe this certainty has been provided by the SNP ministers throughout the passage of this bill. And last week's court session ruling makes it even more difficult for members of the public to discern whether single sex spaces must include those with a gender recognition certificate or otherwise. Despite my many other objections to this bill, I hope we can all agree on the need for legislation that is clear and in plain English, and I so hope you will all support my amendments today. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Webber. Uh, and I call Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 133 and other amendments in the group. Mr Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, can I thank members for their contribution thus far? I think it's actually been a very thought-provoking uh, debate and uh, for the most part courteous. I think that's an incumbent duty on all of us to lead by example on the subject, as contentious as it may be. It's also entirely possible to completely disagree with someone, but absolutely respect the passion with which their speech was made. Uh, that's a respect that's been afforded to me in my contributions, and I think it's a respect that I also owe other members for their contributions. Um, similar to other amendments in this group, and I don't want to rehash any of the arguments that have already been made. Uh, my amendment 133 touches on this issue of the bill and any perceived interaction with the 2010 Equality Act. The basis for that is to address concerns that many have that the legislation might infringe or impact on the 2010 Act. Of course, not everyone agrees with that premise. Many organisations have written to us uh, 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 to say that they do not believe that it impinges on the 2010 Act. They do not believe that this will affect people's access to single-sex spaces. I was particularly struck by the contribution that we were given by organisations such as Women's Aid Scotland, an organisation I have a, a lot of respect for, who have been actually trans-inclusive for a very long time, irrespective of whether those who come for help hold or do not hold a GRC. And it's because of the type of work that they do that I respect their opinion. Who am I to question it? Moreover, we received communication from the Equality and Human Rights Commission, who were also particularly clear in their view that nothing in this bill affects the Equality Act 2010. I presume that underpins the amendment that was uh, passed at stage uh, two. However, there's always a however in this debate, there are many people who do believe that it does. My reporting requirement on this simply asks the government to vindicate that position, their position, the position of many organisations, indeed my own position, that if this bill does not affect the 2010 Act, then let the report show that, because we can then come back to Parliament in three years' time and say that we were right. That's the point of it. But here's where I do think there is an issue. There clearly is a deficiency of clarity. We've heard evidence from a number of stakeholders. We've heard evidence today and in the past about a number of scenarios that we should discuss, and we're right to discuss, what happens in GP surgeries, what happens in the provision of care in public bodies, in sports organisations, in youth groups, in religious places. These are all points which have been respectfully made by members, well-intended points made throughout the debate. Today we heard them from Pam Duncan Glancy, from Rachel Hamilton, Claire Baker, Pam Gossel, Polly McNeil, uh, uh, who's, who's not here at the moment, but I respect what they had to say because there is a perception that any changes that we do make as a result of this bill may have a knock-on effect. <coughs> now, I know what the Cabinet Secretary will say, and I probably agree that none of this is new. People already hold GRCs. People are already able to be excluded from certain spaces under existing legislation. They have been able to be excluded for a very long time, and indeed many people are excluded from those places. I believe this bill does not change that. Others disagree. But here's the but, and it is an important but. Despite my support for the changes that the bill proposes, and let me assure the Chamber that support has not come easy, 
it remains clear that there is ambiguity and there remain concerns. Now, we have a job to do. We have a job to listen to those and listen respectfully to those concerns. We have to ask ourselves, is, is it a reality that there are organisations out there in our constituencies, people that we have heard from, who are afraid about breaking the law by being exclusive? Do they fully understand the guidance that already exists? The, minister, uh, the Cabinet Secretary said that that guidance is wholesome, fulsome, robust and quite clear. But from what I've heard in the Chamber today from contributions, it clearly isn't. There clearly are people who are nervous and unsure about the guidance. Are they clear? Are they certain? And are they comfortable with using existing laws and legislation? Are they comfortable that by being uh, exclusionary, they are not breaking the law? That's a point that Pauline McNeill spoke to at great length. The question for us is how do we fix that? My amendment, as you can see, really takes no side in the debate over whether this bill does or does not interact with the 2010 legislation. But I do struggle with the opposition to my amendment that somehow a reporting requirement will unpick the 2010 Act. I ask simply, in what way will reporting unpick the 2010 Act? I do not know genuinely the answer to that opposition. And I am genuinely trying to be helpful, as I have done in many other groups, as I hope members would concur. Jackie Billy made some excellent points in her contribution around Amendment 111 specifically, that she believes that robust, clear and well-signposted guidance may put to bed some of that ambiguity and concerns. In Sue Weber's words, just given, plain English guidance. She's right to talk about a policy vacuum that, has, that we've allowed to exist and get worse over many years. She's right to talk about interpretations of existing legislation or variations of interpretation that exist across different bodies. We have let that happen. Whilst this bill, in my view, does not change any of those rights, any of those exclusions, any of those interactions, clearly some people think that they do. And by having this debate and by revisiting the 20, 2004 Act, it is inevitable that those old arguments are brought back to the fore. And I don't think we should be afraid to tackle them. What we have to do is consider, are there small organisations out there who are struggling to interpret either existing legislation or what this new legislation might mean for them? I think the answer is yes. There are organisations out there who really do want to do the right thing for trans people who present to them. I firmly believe that. They also want to do right for existing service users as well, and that is to be uh, respected. It cannot be, I cannot be accused <clears throat> in any way of wanting to unravel this bill through any amendments that we're looking at today. I, I really can't see how anyone who's listened to the debate over the last few days could accuse me of wanting to unravel the bill. Far from it. It couldn't be further from the truth. But where I do think is that there must be a middle ground through this, whether that's through guidance, whether that's through reporting, yet in a second, through some of the amendments proposed in this group, which on the face of them seem quite sensible, unambiguous, helpful, useful. I think we have a duty to look at them and the merits of each amendment as they are presented to us today. And I have listened to those arguments that have been very well made. I will give way to the member. Uh, Daniel Johnson. I am very grateful to the member for giving way. And, and can I first of all commend him on the, actually the tone and the way that he has engaged with the debate full stop. But more critically, for those who advocate this change, those who, of us who believe that it's important, clarity is really important. And that's what the, the word that has been used time and time again. So for those that seek to uh, benefit from these rights, they need clarity about how and when they do it. But also those that seek for you know, the, the continued protections, the equality act, they need clarity too. Is that not ultimately what everyone whether they're coming side of, of advocating for this or indeed caution on this, should be seeking to promote and, 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 and ensure is it in this bill. Jamie Green. Can I thank Mr Johnson for his intervention? I, I, I don't disagree with a word he's just said. I think clarity is an easy thing to request. It's not always easy to achieve, though, and, and that's part of the, the problem that we have. How much of this do we have to put on the face of the bill? How much of this would appear in secondary legislation, how much of this will appear in guidance. I don't think it's actually enough to say it's not our responsibility as government to produce this guidance. These are independent uh, pieces of advice that public bodies will deliver for their own service users. I think that is, is taking a step, back to, to, a step too far back. I think government has a duty to help offer that clarity and guidance where it can. I think more could be done. 
I would very much welcome in summing up if the Cabinet Secretary commits to some of that improvement. And, and I don't think it's unreasonable to ask for it. The question that we're facing, though, is whether we do put some of this on the face of the legislation. I guess what I have been nervous about, and I, I won't pretend I haven't been, is that by referring to some of these other pieces of legislation, reserved or otherwise, and I think the member made a, uh, uh, it was either Mr Johnson or Mr Meyer made very valid points about other pieces of legislation that do re refer to reserved legislation and reserved matters, but they haven't been unpicked in any way. But some bills have been unpicked. And as I said, it's no great secret that I, nothing I want to pass today should result in unpicking this legislation. I want to see the improvements that this bill seeks. But in doing so, it is really important that we do it in a way that does find that much needed compromise that I spoke about right at the beginning of today and indeed yesterday. All I would say is ask members, implore all members and the government to try and seek that compromise where it is possible and not to resist for resisting sake. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Green. I now call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Uh, uh, thank you uh, very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank members that have spoken so far? I think this has been a very thoughtful section of the debate. I mean, ultimately, what we're talking about are matters about people's identities, how they live their lives. And when it comes to those matters, nuance is important. Context is important. Those are points that I made during stage two when I was moving amendments uh, regarding guidance for very similar reasons to the, to the ones that Jackie Bailey moves hers this afternoon. You know, it's really important that, that we understand individuals' perspectives, that we ensure that they have the help and support that they need, and that we understand the complexity and sometimes even the contradictory nature some of these rights and perspectives have. And the thing about the Equality Act is it delivers that. It's a bill that actually takes something that's very complicated but delivers that nuance and it delivers balance. It doesn't do so by trumping one set of consideration or another. It does so in a respectful and reflectful way. But the issue I think we're, we're, we're contemplating this afternoon is the fact that the practical effects of the Equality Act and the legal structures and mechanisms sometimes don't necessarily accord, in particular with regard to single-sex exemptions. And I think I would just highlight, uh, you know, first of all, uh, you know, I think I like on, on what Jamie Green has just said. My understanding is that the me legal mechanics are not altered, either by this bill or indeed by Lady Haldane's uh, 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 judgment. But I think what is at issue here is that perhaps the distinctions that people think exist within the Accord Act don't quite exist in the way that they think they do. That while it is possible to distinguish between people who were born with a gender at birth in terms of the single sex provision, but actually the way that the, that is delivered through the Equalities Act is by making those exemptions on the basis that that person is transgender, not on the basis of their underlying biology or physiology. Now that has the same legal effect in practice. And that is, in fact, the way that the Equalities Act that we are all so familiar with and has been so successful in the 12 years since it's been implemented works. But I think what we do in passing this bill, I think, is, I think, raise questions both in terms of the scale and context, I think, as Pauline McNeill and Claire Baker very rightfully uh, pointed out, but ultimately also, and I think in the interventions that Michelle Thompson made and also Ash Regan, it's about the confidence of people to actually draw down the rights that they enjoy of those, how they will continue to be able to do so, and indeed for those that we entrust to oversee systems in, in both the public sector and elsewhere to actually implement those rights. And those things are important because the context has changed and in two fundamental ways. First of all, the scale and scope of, the, of uh, the people that can enjoy transgender uh, certification uh, uh, will be expanded. So people will be having to make those, these decisions more often. They will also, we've, uh, in, 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 we're entrenching within law the principle of self-identification. That therefore, I think, uh, means that we've got a much more complex set of circumstances where someone may be uh, seeking to uh, uphold their, their rights. So this is complex. We're adding to the complexity. And for those arguing and advocating for this bill, that's not a problem. In fact, we should be celebrating that. Because this is nuanced. It is complicated. And actually, we should be reflecting that nuance and the complexity. But we ultimately must also be providing support to those that we seek to uphold the law and implement the law and do so, because it is more complicated. Because ultimately, what we're, is really at issue here is that when we're seeking to implement safe places, some of the detail and nuance is critically important. And that nuance being around a person's anatomy or biology or physiology, however we want to describe it. 
Now, I think those contexts are very narrow indeed. But when those contexts come into play, when they are of importance, those details are incredibly important. And it is therefore vitally important that we have the clarity that we've just been discussing so people can make those determinations. And I think the very fact that we are discussing this, there's been such a loud public debate, so much controversy, has had the chilling effect that we've discussed. People lack the confidence about how and when to apply these principles. And that is ultimately why we must give people that confidence, that we must give them the confidence about what has changed and what has not changed about how they apply that. And ultimately, that is a primary responsibility of government, because this government has a responsibility to ensure that public bodies uphold the law, not just within the scope of the law that we have competence to legislate in this place, but of, over law as a whole, be that Scottish law, UK law, or indeed international law. And just because the law refers to a bit of legislation does not mean that we seek to legislate on it. Just because the law relies on a definition made elsewhere does not say that we are seeking to exert competence. And just because we confer rights on people that are defined or uh, 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 administered by uh, laws set elsewhere does not mean that we seek to change that law or legislate upon it. And I think that is important because it's clear that we've done that in the past. We have given rights of people to vote who have particular immigration statuses. We have given uh, rights in, in, uh, to other people on the basis of what has been defined in other bits of law. And those le bits of legislation have not been unpicked. It's a legitimate thing for us to do. It's legitimate for us to rely on those definitions. It's legitimate for us to seek to be clear about how public bodies uphold the law, whether that be UK law or Scottish law. And indeed, I would say it's a duty of government to do. So that is why amendments 111 and 130 in Jackie Bailey's name are so important because they provide that clarity. And why we need them over and above the EHRC is because context is important. If you read the EHRC guidance, while it is useful, it doesn't explain how this will work in schools. It doesn't explain how this will work in prisons. It doesn't explain how it will work in hospitals. And I think we are all surely aware that those contexts have their own particular considerations, understandings, and sensitivities. And that is why the government, in its duty to help public bodies uphold the law, comply with the law, must produce guidance on how this uh, law will interact with the Equalities Act. This is fundamental because ultimately, if we don't provide that clarity, we are doing a great misjustice to the, the principles that this bill seeks to promote. It will make it harder for people to both enjoy their rights, whether they're transgender or indeed people seeking to uh, enjoy the rights of single sex exemption. So if nothing has changed, let's make that clear. We need the guidance. We need these amendments. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Thank you, Mr Johnson. I now call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Officer. Um, can I agree with Paul McNeill? I think the amendments we have been debating uh, within this grouping are uh, perhaps some of the most important amendments uh, that we will be debating over the next couple of days. Um, I would like to start, with your permission, Deputy President, Officer, by quoting a uh, constituent who has been watching this debate at home on television and she's asked a specific question of the Cabinet Secretary. Her email says this, as a charge nurse on day shift, short staffed as usual, I am sent a clinical support worker, not a registered nurse, from a staff bank who I have not met before and is obviously male. A female patient on the ward has stated but she only wants female staff to provide intimate care for her. The CSW from the staff bank intends to accompany another female and give that individual a bed bath. I reiterate the patient has requested female only care. I do not know what to do as a staff nurse. Do I protect my patient or do I protect the NHS? from being sued. Could the Cabinet Secretary please clarify the situation for me? This is why, President Officer, I stand to speak on some of these amendments, because we have heard from other speakers that there is 
clarity. But there is an individual serving our society here in Lovian who doesn't know what to do. I'm not sure I fully agree uh, with the previous speaker, Mr Johnson, that there is clarity in regard to what the law is. I think we've heard from Paul McNeill, from Jackie Bailey, from others, that there is not clarity in the law. Uh, Daniel Johnson. I, I'd be very grateful. My point is really that fundamentally the mechanics of the law have changed, but actually the nature of the debate does require greater clarity because I think we've reduced that clarity. So actually I'm agreeing with the member. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, my apologies then uh, to Mr Johnson. And if we were debating these amendments six or seven days ago, seven days ago, eight days ago, I think there would have still been lack of clarity. But the decision from the court of session has put greater um, insecurity around what we mean by these definitions. Uh, no lawyer worth their sort is going to jump to a legal judgment within seven days of reading it. There needs to be time for reflection. There needs to be time to work out what uh, her ladyship was saying. And there needs to be time to work out how will this actually work in practice? How does this relate to other areas of the law? Cabinet Secretary. Um, just in case I forget to come back to this, because it is an important point that Jeremy Balfour has raised. Um, first of all, I would point the, the, the constituent that uh, he was uh, referring to, to the guidance that is specific for employers that EHRC uh, have produced. And that's important because the genuine occupation requirement exception under the Equality Act does provide that a person uh, must not be a trans person where there is a requirement due to the nature and context of work, if proportionate. Now, that exception could be used in the health service, for example, where intimate health and personal care uh, is provided. Um, the judgment, Lady Haldane judgment, changes none of that. That is the position under the Equality Act. It was the position uh, two weeks ago, it was the position last week, it's the position today. None of that changes, and I hope that he can reassure his constituent on that matter. Jeremy Balfour. But I think, Cabinet Secretary, you missed the point. What does the staff nurse do to get that patient washed and dressed if that is the only choice they have at the time. Uh, I'm not going to get into a big debate about staff shortages within our NHS at the moment, but we all know that there is a limited number of staff on each ward. And that doesn't give the, the, the guidance of what does the staff, what does the charge nurse do there and then on that shift. And clearly, any advice has not been given down from NHS Lovian to these uh, people in charge of wards to decide. So I don't think, with respect, that clarifies it. So, as I was uh, previously saying, I think we do need a, a moment to pause. Surely our primary purpose within this Parliament is to make good law, to make law that actually helps everybody within Scotland. And until, for me, there is clarity from others with better legal understanding than myself around the judgment, I do think this is an opportunity for us to pause. If I can move uh, briefly to the specific amendments, Deputy Presiding Officer. Amendment 54, as we've heard in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, will require the Scottish Government to produce guidance about the operation of the Gender Recognition Reform Bill. In preparing this guidance, Scottish Ministers would consult statutory bodies concerned with promoting equality or human rights. This all sounds well and good, but we, I will not be supporting this amendment. That is because the Scottish Government's track record of consulting bodies concerned with human rights has been constantly one-sided as we have seen out the progress of this bill. Women's rights organisations have told us that we feel ignored throughout this process. And we have seen people like the UN Special Rapporteur for Violence Against Women and Girls have their voice ignored in favour of another male UN that the Scottish Government prefers to listen to. So I will not be supporting a Scottish Government amendment that will allow them to dictate 
who they deem to be promoting equality in human rights for the purpose of producing guidance. And as I said, I will vote against this amendment. Amendment 111-111 in Jackie Bailey's name would require Scottish ministers to produce guidance on the operation of this Act on the provision of single-sex services, and the amendment specifically mentions settings such as schools, healthcare facilities and prisons, for example. I am very happy to support this amendment because these public service providers need clarity, as I have said a moment ago, on this Act will impact them and whether setting services can be provided so that those born women and girls only. Again, I think there is lack of clarity due to the decision in the Court of Session last week around these issues. Amendment 112, I understand, is not being moved uh, by the member, but actually I think it is a, a good amendment and I would have supported it if she had moved it. Amendment 113, also in Ash Regan's name, further clarifies that nothing in this bill affects the definition of sex in the Equality Act of 2010. And while this is important that it is stated, I know, again, as a result of the recent court session ruling, those who have a gender recognition certificate are included in the definition of sex. And this is something the Scottish Government has failed to address in the terms of single sex space provision. Nevertheless, it is important to put on the face of the bill that the definition under the Equality Act is not altered to avoid confusion uh, for the public. Amendment 117 in Polly McNeill's name is another amendment requiring the production of guidance, this time in relation to be the effect of having a gender recognition certificate. Again, the public deserves certainty on this point. The Scottish Government are expanding the number of people who can apply for certificates, so it will be inevitable that organisations will interact with people obtaining gender recognition certificates, so specifically, is essential. Amendment 129 also requires Scottish Ministers to consult public authorities on the implications of this. Now, we have heard different comments from Scottish Government, but Scottish Government consult all the time with public bodies and organisations, and I still haven't felt clarity on why they simply won't do it on this occasion. Amendment 128, also in Paul McNeill's name, proves beyond doubt that nothing in this Act affects any requirement to collect data on sex, which is also a sensible amendment, and I will support. Amendment 118 and 119 in Claire Baker's name again require Scottish ministers to produce guidance on occupational exceptions to the offence of disclosing information about a person's gender recognition status for the purpose of any occupational requirement. <laughs> Amendment 118 is slightly stronger in the guidance that would require the approval of the Scottish Parliament, but both are, in my view, good amendments that will be needed given that new occupations will be forced to interact with holders of a gender recognition certificate, and it should not be an offence for them to disclose someone's gender recognition certificate status if it is part of their job. Amendment 127, in Jackie Bailey's name, is one of the amendments that the Scottish Government has requested to be withdrawn. The reason is they claim it would change the effect of the Equality Act, which, of course, is a reserved issue. Now, I am absolutely clear that no amendment should be supported if it were to legislate and reserve matters. But it is far from clear that the Scottish Government's interpretation of Amendment 127 is correct. After all, it seems to restate what is already set out and is already stated in law. And I, I hope um, the member will move it. As I understand it, the effect of the amendment is that it puts on the face of the bill paragraph 28 of the Equality Act, which allows for discrimination against those who have undergone gender reassignment surgery when providing a single-sex service even if an individual holds a gender recognition certificate. Now, the Cabinet Secretary will often say that this bill has no effect, and she said it again this afternoon, will have no effect on the ability of single-sex service providers to exclusively provide the services to those born as a woman only. But she now claims that making this clear in the bill will put it at risk of a legal challenge. So the question is, Cabinet Secretary, which is it? 
because her positions are seemingly contradictory. So I will be supporting this amendment unless the Cabinet Secretary can provide a compelling evidence it would be an incompetent amendment, which I highly doubt she were able to do. Finally, Amendment 130 from Jackie Bailey would also secure protections for single-sex services in the Bill by stating that providing a service only to persons of one sex is lawful if it is in accordance with Schedule 3 of the Equality Act. I am also happy to support the amendment on the basis of protecting single-sex services. Even I do not think this will give it adequate protection, but it takes us further down the road. As I said at the beginning of my rem remarks, from a constituent watching this debate this afternoon, there is lack of clarity. I believe without these amendments, and if this becomes law, there will be lack of clarity about how this will work in practice. Bad law is bad for Scotland, is bad for our citizens, and it's bad for this reputation of the Parliament. I ask that you support the amendments I've supported. Thank you, Mr Balfour. I now call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Carol Mopping. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At stage two, the bill was amended by Pam Duncan Glancy to include an avoidance of doubt clause that put on the face of the bill clearly that this legislation does not modify the Equality Act 2010. Indeed, because the Equality Act is UK government legislation, this bill cannot modify it. I would say to those who have argued that it was only last week that we knew, following Lady Haldane's ruling, what sex in that Equality Act 2010 means, I would say this. Those familiar with transgender law will know that in May 2021, 19 months ago, in their book entitled A Practical Guide to Transgender Law, Nicola Newbegin and Robin White clearly define exactly the same meaning. So last week's judgment should not have come as a surprise to anyone. And the Cabinet Secretary has committed to publishing guidance that many people seem, seem concerned about on the operation of this legislation, as her amendment outlines. The only other point I want to make in this grouping is this. If you support the principles of this bill and want to see those principles enacted, then please do not vote for any amendment that risks its legislative competence. It is one thing to have challenges to a piece of legislation made, and we accept that that will happen, but it's one thing to have those challenges made and not upheld. It is quite another to have any, any one of those challenges upheld. Trans people, because this, this is who this bill is for, trans people should not have to wait more than the six years they have already waited to see this bill enacted because of months or even years of legal wranglings or further delays. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Chapman. I now call Carol Mochen to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, when I originally <clears throat> thought to speak in this grouping, I wanted to speak to just my colleague Pauline McNeill's amendment. However, having listened very carefully to the debate, I really want to say I can't not um, speak about some of the other points from some of the very considered speeches that have been made. Um, I can't mention everyone, obviously, but I do appreciate um, the effort that people have put into speaking in this grouping. I want to, in particular, speak about um, my colleague Jackie Bailey's contribution, where she spoke about how, as legislators, we have to make sure the public um, has confidence in what we have done, and I think others have contributed to that and clarity on legal obligations um, for particularly public bodies around um, the obligations in the Equality Act for both women and for transgender people, and others have mentioned that. Um, I want my original contribution was talking about the fact that we have um, talked a great deal about obtaining a GCR, but the amendments in Polly McNeill's name in 117 um, and and of course other contributions from members quite rightly highlight the issue as to what extent does a GRC affect the rights obtained under the Equality Act. This is the crux of much of the opposition to uh, the bill as it has gone through and in many cases people asking, worrying about what will become of the rights and freedoms of women, especially in settings of refuge and treatment. The 210 Equality Act makes clear that the delivery of single-sex services, when it is proportionate and legitimate, is protected. 
but the bill before us seems to cloud that understanding, as we have heard, um, which an, is an outcome that benefits no one and gives no uh, public confidence. Um, as members have given evidence and clarified in this debate, the Equality and Human Rights Commission have said the Government have amended the 2004 Act to an extent that clarity on the operation of the 210 Equality Act is necessary. And I'm not going to, go, going to go back over those arguments because they've been made very well from other people. I, I, I will do. Liam Kerr. Uh, again, I think it's a very measured and interesting contribution like Paulie McNeill's one earlier, but that leads me to pose the same question to the member, that if the member doesn't see the amendments that she's calling for today so that the ambiguity and the concerns that she's rightly articulating remain, does the member nevertheless see herself voting for it? And if so, can she help me understand why? Carol Morgan. Uh, I thank the member very much for that intervention. I know he has uh, done this with other members. Can I be absolutely clear um, that I have come to the chamber today to go through all of these amendments? I have spent hours and hours and hours because this is an important debate. So I will be considering every amendment and I thank members who have indicated where they are and are not supporting but I have been considering every amendment as we go and I will continue to do that. Um, one of the points that I wanted to put on record is that I have been concerned that it seems some believe even asking questions around these as we have gone through this um, uh, asking, round us, uh, asking questions around these matters and it's, it, it is, an, uh, is of itself uh, offensive. But I want to say that I am glad tonight that we have had this debate and I thank members here in the Chamber for being able to discuss these matters. I think that has been a very important point in terms of the public and public confidence. I would argue that the reason these matters keep being discussed and debated is precisely because we do not have clear answers on the provision and as such we must amend the bill to reflect those uh, interests and so I would ask people to support amendments that uh, uh, contribute to that. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, I agree with my uh, colleague Polly McNeill um, and the interpretation that the bill does not affect that the bill does affect the Equalities Act, or at least the operation of the Equalities Act, is unclear, and people have made that point very well. Um, and so, for me, I think it is important that we approve in this Parliament uh, some guidance, and what would be expected is that that would be done as part of amendments to this bill. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Mochrin. Uh, I now call Graham Simpson. Thank you very much. Um, I think this has been a really good debate uh, in this section, some very considered comments uh, indeed, and uh, I'll be supporting most of the amendments uh, in, in this group. Of course, the point of having a, a debate in stage three is that you should listen. And if you hear things that persuade you, you, you could change your mind. And that applies to cabinet secretaries as well. So I hope the Cabinet Secretary has listened to the very considered points that members across the Chamber have been making uh, <coughs> and will perhaps revise her previously stated position on some of these amendments. I was inspired to uh, stand up just now uh, by Jeremy Balfour, actually, because he uh, read out something that a constituent had sent him, and I've also been sent something by a constituent who has concerns about uh, single-sex services for those who have suffered trauma resulting from particular forms of abuse or assault. Uh, and they say they have PTSD and have benefited from trauma services. I will just read out what they say. They say, I know how important trust is within the trauma service, both in relation to who is there with you in waiting rooms or in counselling or therapy sessions. The Equality Act allows someone with protected characteristic of gender reassignment to be excluded from a single sex service, but the change in GLC changes the starting point. This is all their words. Everyone with a GLC would be presumed to be permitted 
within the single sex service because as the judgment last week confirms the GLC changes a person's sex for the purposes of the Equality Act. Exclusion of those of a different biological sex but with a GLC is more difficult. And I will end it there because I think that's a very powerful uh, contribution uh, and it, it in fact is one that has been made maybe not in such personal terms but by many members and that's the, exactly the kind of thing that the Cabinet Secretary should be addressing and I hope she does. I hope she reflects on this debate and changes her mind. Thank you, Mr Simpson. I now call on the Cabinet Secretary to wind up. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding uh, Officer. Um, can I just first of all say that uh, I have listened, and I think there's been some uh, very good and thoughtful contributions, um, and I think, though, that it remains the case that despite some of the intent behind the amendments, that doesn't change the effect of those amendments. And uh, someone, I think it was Jeremy Balfour, actually said that bad law is, is bad for Scotland. And I think that's my point. That's why I've set out my concerns about the amendments uh, within this group. Not, not the issues behind some of those amendments, but the effect of those amendments, and many of which uh, seek to uh, unpick the 2010 Equality Act and give prominence to some parts over others when we already have, as agreed at stage two, a very, very clear amendment that, uh, for the avoidance of doubt, nothing uh, in the Equality Act um, changes. And I'll come back to the Equality Act in a minute. Uh, before I do, I just want to come back to uh, Jackie Bailey's uh, Amendment 127, and I said uh, very clearly um, that the provision uh, would legislate to continue the effect of reserve provisions of the Equality Act and refers to circumstances which are not described in the relevant part of that Act. It is not the case that 127 reflects the words of the Equality Act because the Equality Act does not refer to a GRC. So, I also think um, it is not about trading amendments that if, you know, uh, if we accept 130, then you know, Jackie Bailey won't, won't uh, move 127. It's about getting this legislation right and not having the law of unintended consequences by having amendments that put the bill at risk. And people will have to make a judgment uh, based uh, on all of that. Uh, yes, of Jimmy course. Green. I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary's time and what's been a lengthy debate. And I hope the Cabinet Secretary takes face value and puts some trust in what I'm about to say. At no point, and, and I hope the Cabinet Secretary knows this, am I uh, trying to unpick this bill in any way or jeopardise its future. But it remains to me still quite unclear as to how improving guidance to public bodies and services and improving reporting and putting the onus of that reporting on the government physically and manifestly will unpick other pieces of legislation and put this bill at risk. And if she can answer that question, I'd be hugely grateful, because it is an issue I've struggled with. Cabinet Secretary. So let me be very clear. Um, guidance and reporting are really, really important, and they're key parts of this bill. But we can only do that in relation to devolved competence. What we can't do is re review uh, the, the impact of the Equality Act, because that that lies elsewhere and the responsibility for that lies elsewhere. However, I'm trying to go as far as I can with this and what I have said already is that we'll work with the EHRC uh, on guidance and we will work with them if it helps uh, to, to be clearer uh, to provide that clarity to public bodies. If public bodies, and I've heard quite a lot of members just in a second talk about uh, public bodies requiring clarity. Uh, now, the clarity relating to the Equality Act has to be led by the EHRC, and we've already referred to many parts, whether it's the advice to employers that they uh, provide or the advice to public bodies. So they have to be in the lead of this. They are literally the guardians of the Equality Act. But what I'm offering to do is to work with the EHRC and indeed uh, to help work with them to help provide that clarity. But they have to lead that process. Yes. Daniel Johnson. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving me, but can she please provide clarity? Because if she's contending that if a bit of legislation that we pass from this Parliament 
refers to UK legislation and seeks to definitions in terms of what is net, that becomes incompetent. Then we have got a significant number of problems in legislation we've already passed, because that is what we do all the time. Is, is, that, is that what she's contending, that using a definition in criminal rights on the basis of UK law is not competent? What can I'm say, saying is can the I say amendment that before we you continue, can I, can I just invite, I know there's a number of members that have recently come into the chamber, there are a number of conversations that are starting to get a little you know, on the loud side. I'd, I appreciate it. I know it's been a long um, uh, grouping, uh, a long debate, um, but if we could um, bear with us for the next uh, short while, um, I, I think that would be polite to the Cabinet Secretary and others who are contributing. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, I'm not saying that because uh, the amendment passed at stage two refers to the Equality Act, but Amendment 127 goes further than that. As I've explained on a number of occasions, the, uh, it's not the, the case that it just re refers and reflects the wording of the Equality Act, because the Equality Act doesn't refer to a GRC. 127 goes much further than that, and that is why I'm asking people to consider that very, very carefully. Uh, before uh, voting uh, on that amendment. Uh, just that I want to make some progress. Uh, a number of members have referred to the issue of uh, the Equality Act and the effect of a GRC. And I want to be absolutely clear uh, again uh, to, for, for the avoidance of, of any doubt. Let me just be really, really clear uh, about that. The provisions of the 2010 Act are not modified by the proposals in this Bill. And as I said, we have agreed on an amendment at stage two that puts that beyond doubt. The Bill does not change the legal effects of a GRC as they are currently set out in the 2004 Act, nor does the Bill change public policy around the provision of single-sex spaces and services. The Equality Act allows for the provision of single-sex services in certain circumstances and the exclusion uh, of uh, trans women uh, in those circumstances where that is uh, proportionate uh, or a, a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. Uh, whether they have changed their, uh, legally changed their gender or not, uh, that power exists. And there are examples given in the guidance uh, in the Equality Act that help to, just a minute, that help to uh, make that clear. And we support the provision of single-sex services. I've said that over and over again, and are clear that all organisations uh, need to absolutely take account of the Equality Act to ensure everyone's rights are protected. And the Equality and Human Rights Commission as I said, has published not just guidance but a statutory code of practice which assists service providers with understanding the relevant uh, issues. I also, uh, in terms of occupations, I laid out to Jeremy Balfour where they have got explicit advice to employers. Uh, but, as I've said, if the members feel that there is more work that needs to be done in that area, then I am absolutely uh, um, prepared and keen to work with the Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, in doing that. I also want to, to be very clear on this as well. I want to be really clear on this as well. And that is just, just a minute. I want to be really clear on this as well. Uh, and that is that the position of the, the Haldane judgment uh, is absolutely consistent with that of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Now, members across this chamber have often cited to me the views of the Equality and Human Rights Commission, and they are, as members have said, the guardians of the Equality Act. And they have said exactly what we have said, that the, the purposes uh, of the Equality Act 2010, sex takes into account the legal effect of a GRC, a GRC obtained in accordance uh, with the Gender Recognition Act uh, 2004. Nothing has changed from that judgment whatsoever. That has been the position previous to the judgment, and it is the position now. I am happy to give way. Douglas Ross. I am very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. I understand she was reading from her notes, but my colleague Sue Webber has twice tried to... No, no, I'm just saying the Cabinet Secretary couldn't have seen a message that came up on the screen. I, I hope we can maybe look at a process where the presiding officer could indicate, but would the Cabinet Secretary take a virtual uh, uh, point from my colleague Sue Webber, who has now tried to intervene? Um, Cabinet I'm Secretary. happy to do that if there's a virtual point of order, if that would be helpful from Sue Webber. Yes. 
I think it would be up to Sue Webber as to whether or not she wants to press for another intervention. It's not for the chair to, to, to indicate, as, right. we wouldn't in, as we would not indicate. Okay, yeah. right. Intervention, yes. Sue Webber. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for taking my intervention. I was wondering if you could give us some examples, specific examples, of where it is proportionate to discriminate against those with a gender recognition certificate for the purposes of providing a single sex service. Cabinet Secretary. I'm happy to do that because in the Equality Act 2010, in the guidance, the specific example that is given is if there is a, a service that provides uh, support to victims of sexual assault, for example, then they say that is absolutely uh, valid and proportionate to exclude trans women, whether or not they have a gender recognition certificate. So I hope that answers uh, Sue Weber's point. Now, the guidance is there to help organisations to uh, address uh, the circumstances of where that is proportionate. And the guidance, the revised guidance, goes into a lot of detail in recognition that sometimes uh, some organisations uh, may uh, have challenges with that. I want, I want to make some progress on the guidance. The guidance, uh, and I should say um, again, that the Scottish Government guidance uh, in, in law would make that statutory guidance. And I think it was Claire Baker asked what, what aspects of the Act were covered by the guidance. All aspects of, the, of this bill will be covered uh, by the guidance. Also, we've committed to review section 22. Um, uh, already, um, previously, we, we committed to review that, and the guidance will cover the operation uh, of the Act, including section 22. So I hope that gives uh, some uh, assurance uh, to uh, Claire Baker. Um, Polly McNeil uh, referenced uh, a number uh, of things, one of which was the UK Government Women and Equalities Committee. And of course, though that committee reviewed these issues in some detail, and of course they themselves concluded that the UK system should be reformed along the lines of what this bill uh, seeks to do. And I think that is important to note. Um, Presiding officer, there have been many uh, issues uh, made uh, comments made around uh, areas surrounding uh, this, this bill. And I just want to say this. I have listened to organisations both for and against this bill. I've met with women's organisations who are for and against uh, this bill. And of course, it's worth noting that many of the women's organisations that are providing services to some of our most vulnerable women actually support this bill, and that's important to note. And I just want to end with on this uh, as well. I've been in this parliament for near on 20 years now, and uh, I want to say this, that at the heart of many of the policies and legislation that this parliament has given its attention to has been absolutely the protection of women and girls, whether that's through legislation on domestic abuse, whether it's through our groundbreaking equally safe strategy. And in fact, the work on the misogyny legislation is underway and they're going to consult on that very soon indeed. So I think it is fair, I, I will in a minute. I think it is absolutely the case that women across this chamber, previous, current, and I'm sure that future, have put what the safety and the interests of women and girls at the heart of the work that this parliament carries out. I'll give this Jackie Bailey. Can I absolutely agree with the point made by the Cabinet Secretary? Successive governments have indeed done as she describes, which is why I'm genuinely confused as to why she won't support Amendment 130, because she agrees that these are the provisions in the Equality Act that she supports. She outlined them. Um, they do no more than repeat those. Um, and these are the very issues that a lot of women and a lot of women's organisations have said they have concerns about. So in the spirit of what she said, surely we can approve 130. Cabinet Let me be Secretary. really clear with Jackie Bailey. I absolutely accept the intent behind her amendment. But the intent behind her amendment and what she seeks to achieve is already covered in the amendment agreed at stage two that for the avoidance of doubt, absolutely nothing 
Nothing in the Equality Act is affected by this bill. And I cannot be clearer than that. And I would have thought, as a point of unity, we could agree that to reinforce that, because we don't want people to be concerned about something that, in reality, is not the case. Even if we wanted to, which we do not want to do, we wanted to ch somehow change aspects of the Equality Act. We are not able to do that. We don't have the competence to do that. And so let me just be absolutely clear, for the avoidance of doubt again, the Equality Act protections are absolutely fundamental here. Single-sex exceptions are absolutely guaranteed in the same way as they have been since the 2010 Act came into being. I have no intention, and my government has no intention, and this bill has no intention of changing that whatsoever. And I hope that members will support my amendment 54 and vote against the other amendments in this group. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, the question is that Amendment 54 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Point of order, Douglas Ross. I'm grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Before we come to the votes on this group of amendments, the Presiding Officer earlier ruled on the proposal for a manuscript amendment from my colleague uh, Rachel Hamilton. Uh, the consideration of the Presiding Officer lasted from uh, 2.53 to 4.08 at one hour and 15 minutes, which I welcome. This was clearly uh, a very difficult choice for the Presiding Officer. Indeed, she said uh, in her ruling that she accepts that this amendment could not have been lodged uh, before the deadline. It therefore came down to the opportunity to lodge a manuscript uh, amendment earlier than today. I have looked at the standing orders of this Parliament and there is nothing in the standing order concerning manuscript amendments about a timing for introducing that. So was the presiding officer's ruling that it should have been earlier today, uh, yesterday or at what point from 12 noon on Tuesday when the ruling was made by Lady Haldane? I also note that the committee this Parliament has asked to scrutinise this bill did not seek to have an emergency session on Lady Haldane's ruling. The committee was able to have an emergency session in the intervening period, and one of the witnesses who was uh, uh, brought forward by the committee had already given evidence. And I find it strange that someone could be asked to come back to give evidence in that time when we couldn't look uh, at this uh, important ruling. Uh, therefore, I wonder, Presiding Officer, before we enter the votes on this issue, uh, if you could confirm if the Presiding Officer had considered the fact that the committee had not had an extra session on this ruling. Uh, and if you are able to confirm that from the presiding officer. Uh, and could I, through you, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, repeat my uh, offer uh, and indeed my request to the First Minister, who is in the chamber right now. If the presiding officer's ruling on such a crucial issue rests on the fact that we have to get through amendments today and the timing it therefore led the presiding officer to make this difficult decision, Surely the First Minister could meet with myself and other party leaders to look at scheduling the remainder of this debate on amendments and the Stage 3 debate early in the new year so this Parliament can be fully appraised of all the points before it votes on this issue. Thank you, Mr Ross. Um, I think the presiding officer made her position entirely clear. She explained the basis on which that decision uh, was taken. And I'm sure, as an experienced parliamentarian, you would not be challenging the ruling of the presiding officer. Can I... Sorry, sorry, this doesn't need the applause of other members uh, in the chamber, I have to say. It will also, you'll be aware, Mr Ross, that business managers are due to meet very, very shortly to discuss the remaining business um, this evening. And that, Mr Ross, I, I have taken the point of order. If this is a repeat of the same point of order, I have nothing further to add. And I would warn you that you are at risk of challenging a ruling by the presiding officer. Mr Ross. And I hope uh, you will see I am not trying to do that, and I made it very clear I was not doing that. But I did ask to allow me, as a member of this Parliament, to understand that the ruling that the presiding officer made, was she aware of the fact that the committee we have tasked to scrutinise and take this bill up to this point had not had Mr. the opportunity... Mr Ross, could you please resume your seat? As I've explained, the presiding officer gave her ruling, she explained the basis of it, and as you yourself acknowledge, some time was taken 
taken in arriving in that decision and coming forward with her ruling. On that basis, it is time to move on. A question, the question is that Amendment 54 be... Are you challenging the... No, I'm, I'm saying further... To Could you please resume your seat, Mr Ross? I have warned you about challenging the decisions of the Chair. Your previous attempt at a point of order was simply a repeat of the earlier one, and I've already pointed out to you that that bordered on challenging the ruling and the decision made by the presiding officer. If this is a different point, I'll invite you to make it, Mr Ross. But I would stress very strongly that you are skirting close to call it being in contempt of the Parliament by calling into question, calling into question, calling into question a ruling by the presiding officer, Mr. Ross. I, I, I'm grateful for you allowing this subsequent point of order, but I am simply trying to get all the facts as a member of this Parliament who is just about to vote on this issue. So, are you able to confirm or otherwise if the presiding officer considered the point about the committee that is scrutinising this bill when she made her ruling? I, I'm simply asking for that information, not challenging the ruling that was made. Mr Ross, there was nothing further in that uh, contribution to what you'd asked in your previous two contributions. We are going to move on to the question that Amendment 54 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. Okay. Right, we are in the middle of a division. I will take the point of order after the division. Please resume your seat, Ms McCall. The question is that Amendment 54 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. Okay, the earlier vote had already started by the time I called it, therefore we're going to rerun the vote to ensure that nobody uh, that was attempting to vote uh, does not have an opportunity to vote. Um, the question is Amendment 54 be agreed and members should uh, cast their votes now. Okay, I can advise the Chamber that we are going to attempt to run that vote uh, again. Members should cast their votes now.
and the vote is closed. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 54 in the name of Shona Robertson is yes, 94, no, 31. There were no abstentions. That amendment is therefore agreed. I'll take a point of order from Rose McCall. Uh, thank you. Oh, there we go. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm just trying to get some clarity, if I may. During uh, Group 13's debate, we extended the business for two hours. Um, You'll know after these amendments, um, and the programme suggests that we've got over an hour of portfolio questions, then two hours of debate, followed by decision time. Now, I've previously mentioned in this chamber that I am the carer of my husband, and I made arrangements yesterday and today so that he was taken care of, um, and I did that uh, for a time that was meant to finish at about half past six, which brings me to my questions, and there's a couple. Um, will you be making more extensions to business tonight? If so, when will we, will we have that information so that I, I can make extra arrangements? Um, and lastly, I, I can't help but notice that um, I'm the third member to raise the impact of, of this sort of thing on family and carers this week. So will you consider keeping decision time at an earlier, more convenient time than we've experienced over the last couple of days? And I thank you for taking the point of order. Thank you very much for that point of order, Ms McCall. It echoes earlier points of order. I think, as I said previously in response to that point of order, it, that is a point that the presiding officer has underscored on numerous occasions with business managers. I can advise uh, you and the rest of the chamber that business managers will be meeting after the next vote. Um, I'm sure they'll be seized of the points that you have uh, just made. Uh, and further to that meeting of the business managers, I would hope that the uh, chamber can be advised uh, on any decisions arising from that. But thank you very much indeed. Uh, with that, we move on to, I call Amendment um, 111 in the name of Jackie Bailey, uh, already debated with Amendment 54. Uh, Jackie Bailey, to move or not move? Moved. Uh, the, um, the question is that Amendment 111 uh, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is closed. Okay, the result of the vote on amendment number 111 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, uh, 55, no, sorry, 58, no, 65. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Um, as I just advised Ms McCall and the Chamber, there will be a short suspension now uh, to allow both a comfort break and um, minister, uh, business managers to meet. Um, the bell will uh, sound when we are about to resume. Thank you.